Sean Finney. <laughs> <laughs> That was a really great conversation too. Yeah, I know. Well, this is how we're going to start it. I just we just had a ten minute conversation and I forgot to hit record because um, fucking Tony's away and I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. So I'm pressing all these fucking buttons. So yeah, we're just going to recap that. Um, I started by saying I'm a known exaggerator and don't believe everything I say or do believe it, but dumb it down. And then you bullied me about my facial hair and looking like Joe Exotic. <laughs> this is true. A fairly good summation. That's of a that. pretty good summation. Yeah. I do have the audio of it. I don't know. You might as well just put the audio in over black. <laughs> oh, we got the audio. We got the audio for Spotify anyway. What's up, YouTube? Yeah. Uh, stick figure drawings. We'll just do a little cartoon <laughs> it's a of us great drawing. Yeah, yeah. Anime. Or a mon- we could just do a three-minute montage of all my looks over the years: fat me, skinny me, top knot me, neck beard me. That's a great idea. Yeah, you have a lot. You've of all the people I know because I do one of those things where I feel. I've done more in the last sort of 10 years, but prior to that, I was like, I used to see people like John Kufos and he had like all of these really definitive looks through the times. And I was like, I was always just like short hair, grow it a little bit longer, shave it off, always wore like white t-shirts, jeans and stuff like that. And I was like, man, I'm not putting myself out there, but it's just not fucking who I am. And then I see other friends like, you've had definitive, I can, I can look at, if someone shows me a photo of something, I can I can date it by the what you what you look like because <laughs> there's definitive eras. Look, I'm a I'm a I'm a time capsule. <laughs> um, just use me as uh, the measuring stick for time, really. So what's going on? What brings you back to Perth? Um, it's been stuck in Melbourne for two and a half years, nearly, and then being able to come back without needing to isolate and COVID test and all that shit. And then we could have come back a little bit before, but just been fucking busy. Melbourne opened up. We've been on, and then also. I just waited for your shit show to be a little bit more over. Yeah. Um, now I can go out and you know not have to sit down to drink and stuff like that. And then just see family. That's it. Family and friends. Uh, I wish I saw more people, but time is fleeting here. But yeah, just come back and catch up with everyone. See my mom, see Rom's mom. Um, we just lost both of our grandparents. So it was like catching up with them, doing that. And then just hanging out, seeing you legends, seeing Bradshaw and whoever, just kind of hanging out, stay in the city. Just good to be back for a little bit. Does it kind of make it... Do you look at it and go, well, I definitely made the right move moving to Melbourne? Fuck yeah. Yeah. Fuck Perth. Nah, I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that in, a, in the most endearing way. Like, I love Melbourne. It is, it is the best city in the world. And for me, um, I think, full stop, uh, we have more than one road, which is kind of cool. The freeway's a recurring theme in this podcast, and it <laughs> fucking sucks. Took me 90 minutes to get from Rockingham the other week in the rain. Terrible. Uh, but no, Melbourne's right for me, especially... At the time, it was very right because I was touring, um, doing music, film, photo stuff. I did like 20 plus flights in like the year leading up to moving to the East Coast. So it was like, just made sense. And then Rom got a job offer, relocated us and then just hit the ground running. Obviously, worked really closely with Adam and that's blossomed wonderfully since we've been there. Um, yeah, it just feels right. Coming back to Perth, I, I miss it. Don't get me wrong. I'm like, I miss the beach. I miss you know, the people, but I feel at home in Melbourne. Like we first moved there and I've never, not that I've never felt at home. Um, Perth was my home, but I moved there. Even our shitty, crappy, moldy, like art, post art deco place we first moved into and it sucked. It was just cold and dark and miserable the whole time. But I was like, I feel like I'm home. Like I feel like I can plant some roots here and grow. Do you think that that's because, cause I'm thinking about this now cause I'm off to London pretty soon. Um, just as a dip my toes sort of trial run. But did you feel like it's because it's the first decision that you guys have made really for yourselves where it's like, you know, we're here because we chose to be here and this is us building our own lives? Or is it like, because you know when you live in Perth, you're like, yeah, we're going to get a rental in a suburb that we can afford and then you build yourself up to a, a level where you live where you want to and stuff like that. But you're still very much on the platform or on the trainer wheels that you were given as a kid. Um. Yeah, to a degree. I think we'd already done that step a little bit because we grew up in Rockingham. We'd met there. All my family lived there. Rom's family lived there. Like, it's kind of that kind of microcosm. You you know, you're born there, you live there, you die there kind of thing. So we moved to the city um, away from everything we knew. Like, I had a few friends, but not many. Like, I didn't know many people when I moved to Perth. I was still shooting gigs, but only like one or two nights a week and that. So we'd already taken that little step. So it just seemed like a further extension of 
making our own life and carving our own path and just fucking doing it. It was terrifying. Like I remember first quitting my job when I was with you, you bullied me into quitting my job, literally bullied. Like every day I'd come in, you'd be like, what the fuck are you doing, man? It was just like, I do that because I do that to everyone because I'm like, you can really do this, but you need to really do it. Like you were, you were working for us doing um, videography and photos for, and, and photos for the, for the nightclub take stuff. Take photos with people with fucking dildos and whipped cream and all sorts of wild shit. Yeah, that was definitely a you and Delby thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, was, it was a moment. But yeah, those times, like, I see you come in and obviously other little freelancers, people would come in and it was like, yo, you know what you're doing. <clears throat> you can fully just do this. You need to just quit your other job and then you're going to have no choice but to do this. Yeah, and uh, moving to Melbourne was very much like that as well like i i don't like saying it because it makes me sound like a conceited fuckwit but it's like i was you know big fish in a little pond in terms of nightlife and you know music video and stuff like that and moving to melbourne it was not that at all i'm fucking i'm still a no one so Mm. it was like that challenge that was like if i want to do more and create more and leave my mark on the world i felt like i had to leave perth Uh, and i've always loved melbourne since i was like 13 i was always like a little grungy little emo kid flying over there to go for gigs if I could and stuff like that and I was like I want to live over there and then I made it happen so it's a it's a culmination of all those things that led up to that point and Rom's the same she loves the city she's a city person and it just felt right and we moved there and it feels like home that's sick which is cool it's fucking sick you were doing because when you were here you started getting into a lot of um you were touring heaps and filming for like uh acts like illy and um you did some stuff with draft um no adam did the stuff with draft i did like i, I did i did a national tour with zomboy i did i think some touch based stuff i was doing uh origin here like adam and i were running the film i guess the media management of that and then yeah touring a bunch of other stuff doing some stuff for like random shit like soundcloud and just lots of live music mostly edm and rap stuff so that's kind of where I was going and that's what I moved over there a little bit for because I was like based in Perth I'm missing so many tours and so many opportunities because the flight to Perth the bands often didn't tour here and they would end a tour in Perth and start in Melbourne sort of bring me across and then back it made no sense for them um so that was kind of one of the you know the impetus to move over was that that push every all the artists were like just dude move over you'll get so much more work and I, I did for the first year and then COVID happened as with everything and I just kind of fucked off the music industry. Yeah. Um, Because it's a shitty soul-sucking place a lot of the time. Like, I'll I'll be very candid with it. Like, the best thing in the world, I've toured Australia, I've been all over the world, I've done some, I've seen some insane shit. I I got paid to party for a living, basically. That's what it comes down to. Pays terrible, um, but livable. uh, But... It's just, you just get abused, you're bottom of the rung and I, you accept your place, you're not the artist, but it's just no way to live. And I don't want to be that weird, you know, you know, go to a club night or some shit like that and there's some weird 45 year old cunt with a camera and you're just like, what are you doing, brother? Like, the, that was always a risk, man. Fucking get a job. Being involved in any of that stuff, that was always the risk. It was like, you needed to know before you aged out of it. Yeah. Because people do hang on. We spoke about it a bunch of times. A crafter was talking about it the other week about like, you need to let go. Otherwise you just become one of those what, what was the the band um 28, 28 days 28 days yeah, yeah i listened to that but fucking yeah i had a good laugh at that because i uh i identify with that deeply um the people that i deal with and you see like even managers my, like artist managers and stuff and they're just doing the same shit the same skeezy bullshit and then covid came out i got offered a bunch of tours and they're like oh you know it's been so tough COVID sucked, we've got no money. The artist was the only person making it. Are you sure they lost stuff, but they're still getting a bit of revenue? They've still got their 360 deals. And they're like, oh, can you come on tour? And I'm like, yeah, cool, send me the rates. And they're like, oh, so it's it's $100 a show and a $30 per DM for like a four week tour. And I'm like, I can't pay There's rent. There's no chance I can't enough. fucking pay rent. Like I won't be able to survive doing that. And they're like, oh, you know, for old time's sake. I was like, old time's sake are done. Like I've got those memories, some of the best memories of my life. And some of my closest friends are from it. Like one of my good friends is a, uh, very close with Ben, who's a drummer. He's an incredible dude. Like I'm so close with him and I've, you know, many memories. We did 60 days, 60 or 50 regional tours around Australia. It's sick, but kind of just grown up a bit. Yeah. And just pass the torch onto a young young kid. It's a young kid's game. And I'm not I'm not old, I'm fucking thirty one, but there's time to move on. And I'll still do music, I'll still take opportunities when they come, but I just 
it's not right for me and I also don't like the way the music industry is heading. It's always been in a pretty gross industry and it's there's you know all the me too movements and all of those uh, movements about you know helping people get paid more and stuff like that but i feel like the last 24 36 months it's somewhat even regressed from where it was heading just with all of this global shit and it's just i just it's just gross and i don't i don't fuck with it oh the industry's always been gross man like the people the people that are involved in i, I always think like the artistry of it is great but and then the industry is just there to suck and that's it's what it all is. out of that, you know? Like, I love music. I, I live live for it. I was, grew up going to fucking HQ. Dude, dude man giving me a pass to go shoot. God rest his soul. Um, is dude man dead? I think so. He might not be. Sorry, dude. If you're dead, dude man, <laughs> rest in peace. If you're not, fucking my bad. So dude man was a, um, dude man was a promoter that ran all ages events in Rockingham, right? No, 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 no. He ran the HQ. Oh, no, he did run he HQ. He was the yeah. old grumpy dude at HQ that everyone loved but hated at the same time. Yeah, I have a feeling he died, eh? Yeah, I think he's dead. I'm going to do a young Tony look it up while you keep See, talking. Rest in peace, dude, man. <laughs> yeah, I got banned from HQ from dude, man. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, like, I, I love it, but it's just not for me anymore. Like, Adam and I have these decisions now. If, like, if a job crosses my desk and there's a red flag pops up, we stop getting excited. We sit down and we look at it and go, all right, there's been a red flag. Even if it's a tiny red flag, we go, what is it? And every music job that's crossed my desk in the last year, it's just fucking lit up with red flags. Uh, there's a, a couple that have come up recently. I've, you know, maybe do a couple of music videos coming up, which I will do because they're not red flags. And that's a little bit different to touring. Um, but most of it is pretty, pretty rubbish. Um, and I'll, I'm sure people listen to this being like, you little f dirty fuck, you're saying that and you're dealing with this. But it's not aimed at anyone in particular, but I just think people need to step up and look out for each other more than they do. And just don't, you know what it is? Just don't be a cunt. Mm. That's it. That's what life is about. But specifically talking about this, just stop being cunts. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a weird, there's such a weird flex in that music industry, especially amongst agents and managers. Like, and I know some great agents and some great managers, but a lot of people come in there young and they see the way that the industry is and they're like taught they're sort of like grandfathered in by other people and they think that the only way to be is to be like a prick when you're winning and then be you know when when the chips are down it's like oh can you like yeah that we've got no money so that there's really limited budget for this and stuff like that and they expect everyone to work for the the experience like it's like yeah you know we're really doing something here it's like Yo, you, if I manage, like if I direct your music video and you go up to the next level, then you're going to get someone that's a bigger name to do the next thing. Like I don't, I don't win with you, so I'm not going to lose with you. Yeah, you're just a stepping stone for yeah. their career and nothing else. And people forget that you have your own career. Um, you might need to edit this out. I'm not sure I'll discuss it afterwards, but I got, I got asked to do a gig recently. Um, budget was terrible. Big headline act. They're, I don't know what they're earning, but it's fucking a decent five figure sum. I came back with a quote that was reasonable, wasn't expensive, but it was like, this is what I need to do the job. And the reply come back going, cool, that's out of our budget. And I, I understand, cause I understand that you don't really play in this world anymore. I was like, what the fuck do you mean by that? Play in the world where you don't pay people or play in the world where you're happy to take advantage of, or I'm not sure if it was like a, a backhanded compliment for rising up in the world or it was a snarky stab because I it's, didn't want to suck their dick. It's a backhanded compliment of them saying, Oh, you know your worth now. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what it comes down to. And it happens all the time, you know, like, you know your worth now. You can only go so far with, especially with artists, it's like you're on there for the journey in the beginning and, you know, you see someone really pop off and, and she go, well, same happens with design. But then when it's, when you start getting, the, the worst one is that you, you'll have a relationship with the artist and then the management will step in and be like, oh yeah, well, we need this, 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 and this. And it's like, yo, I'm happy to do some stuff for my friend. But as soon as I'm dealing with labels and artists and stuff, you guys are at labels and, and agents and things like that. Like you need to start putting budget in because you're not my friend. Yeah. I've started doing that as well. So I deal with a couple of artists and like stop touring with them now or whatever. And they'll give me a message and be like, Hey man, do you have this old footage from this? Blah, blah, I'm doing this. And I'll be like, yeah, man, here's a Dropbox set it away. Like we're mates. And then the management will step in and say something else. And they'll just like take and take and take. So I'm just trying to just deal with artists now because I'll speak to them about a mate 
or as a mate, and if I'm like, hey, I can't do this because this, they're always like, yeah, cool. And it's never the artist, like, all the, like touring with Illy, for example, he's a really good mate of mine. I've never had any issues. And their management's been good as well, but like other artists, um, the, the artist's really good, but then the management step in and they're just like, they don't, they tell me something and tell the artist something different. And the artist gets fucked as much as you do as well. It's, I think it comes from the top and that needs to change fundamentally. But anyway, we digress. How did you find the pivot out of music uh, and into into what you do now? It was just organic. I had to. COVID just stopped. I lost everything. Fucking, I was still doing corporate stuff here. Adam and I were doing corporate jobs. I was doing TV commercials. Um, some I did a like two weeks in India for Channel Ten and a company called Himalayan Heroes running dirt bikes and stuff, which was cool. So I was doing a few corporate jobs. Then COVID finished. Well, COVID happened came out there's no real chance for me to do music stuff because music still wasn't happening so i was like all right now's the time to sounds i hate the term level up but it was it's time to level up and do bigger things adam was already doing some fashion stuff i got toned into that because my specialty is more filmmaking and cinema directing and then we just kind of pushed that hard and we're good at what we do um and that's kind of it. So it, wa- it wasn't so much of a pivot. It was just a necessity. And necessity, you know, uh, feeds all kinds of stuff. Um, and when you have to do something, you can't just lay down and fucking die. You just have to, you know, grab life and just jump in with it. And that's what we you do. you got to make it happen. Like, that's the thing is, like, when your back's to the wall, I mean, it happened to everyone during COVID. Like, especially people that are self-employed. It happened and you're just like, I need to fucking make money. I don't care about like my creative output right now. It's like, I need to be able to pay rent. Dude, I was editing fucking TikToks for people and shit. It was soul destroying. I was looking at my life. I was like sitting in my underwear at like 2 a.m. editing TikToks for people. I'm like, what have I fucking become? <laughs> um, but it got me out of it. And then we just, just did it. And here we are now doing cooler stuff and really focusing on us as a production company. We're, you know, officially officially a company now good old beagle and hound and here we are doing our thing see what happens next but if you told me when we're sitting in the office what seven years ago you're like what are you doing now i'd be like i'll be on tour with a fucking i don't know a skrillex or some shit not doing this and i'm so glad i didn't end up being that dude eh? it'd be a tough it'd be such a tough thing what did you have on tour you got some some memorable sort of tour was there was there any way you were just like what the fuck am i doing here so do the amount of times I was like in Canberra at 4 a.m. in some fucking shitty hotel doing a bunch of shitty drugs. Masturbating furiously. Masturbating furiously to, <laughs> to get no to no end. Yeah, to get to sleep and just crying, going, What the fuck am I doing with my life? Or getting a knock on the door at 10 a.m. when you've missed lobby call and you're a piece of shit and you have to have the deliverables done half an hour later. And it's just a fuck it. It's a real grim reality check. It's a, it's a real grim. I've had some of the best memories, best parties, best seen the best live acts. I saw fucking, you know, bands I've never dreamed of seeing like at the drive-in play and all kinds of cool shit that I've grown up wanting to do. But then there's some real grim stuff that at the time seems cool. Like, let's go and party and get a bag and kick on. And then it gets to four, five, six, seven a.m. And you're like, what am I doing with my fucking life? Did you ever find that thing where, cause as a human being, like you're a personable person, like, and you always have been. And that's what like endeared you to me outside of the neck beard at the time. And it was like, you did you ever find that it was one of those things where you were like i am i'm here and i'm a part of this experience but i'm also working yeah and you get kind of caught up in the party of it and then you're like oh i'm not like because when the act is when the act's on stage that's their job and then when they come off stage it's done and they all kind of party and stuff and then you're like yeah, I've got to film you on stage, but I also need to make sure that I'm up and, you know, having these deliverables and stuff like that. But at the same time, you're getting sucked into the lifestyle and the experience. It depends on the artist. Um, Some artists want you to be a part of that party. And if a few deliverables fall by the wayside, they're okay with it because you become part of the band, essentially. And it's the whole crew becomes part of the band, the sound tech, the roadies, the loaders, everyone. Um, But then some other people are like, you can party with us but you have to fucking work and deliver. And I think that's a definition 
of artists that stay successful and don't um, is to be able to switch on. But it, it is, it's a you tread a fine tightrope because you're not just the artist goes on stage and their whole life's up to it. Obviously, they're still working all the time and I won't discredit that. But like I'm filming pre-show, I'm filming show, I'm filming post-show, I'm filming in transit, I'm taking photos of this, I'm sending cutaways to agencies or label or for the artist social media and I'm still trying to book other tours at the same time so it's 24 7 and you get sucked into the life and I'm bad with that like I have no self-control whatsoever um I'm learning it slowly as I get older but you know my ADD which comes to as a surprise to no one um that I have it is has a propensity for you know addiction and do dopamine hits yeah and a party is a fucking dopamine hit a festival's a dopamine hit and it's so easy to get caught up with that so I think that was part of my problem as well as it's it's a dangerous place for someone, and I think a lot of people who tour living, tour for a living, have that, you know, uh, neurodiverse predisposition that you get sucked into that. Definitely, I think it comes handy now with creativity to some to some degree. There's some stuff like I remember when we did Stormzy, um, Stormzy's first Australian tour, and we did the the Perth show, and um, you came along and filmed for us. I think it was like a Canvas and Street Exposant, and straight away like that, that show was fucking crazy it was the craziest yeah. small show i've ever seen broke the fucking stage yeah that was actually fucking wild like and i remember just before he went on stage because it was the first show that he'd done outside of europe and he was like this is absolutely crazy because people were like chanting his name it was like a thursday night but i remember you filming that and then I don't know where you edited it it might have green been in the green room yeah before and they left they had an edit on their instagram because he was like oh any chance we can get it soon? I was like, I can do it right fucking now. He's like, you can what? And I was like, that's what I do. And just did it. It was rubbish. I looked back at it the other day and I was like, God, I fucking sucked, eh? Yeah, but the thing is that you had the ability to actually output that quickly. It was the same as Liam. Remember, like Liam Underwood was the same. He was just like, oh, I can do this. Most part, you know, because when you start quoting jobs and doing bigger things and like having time, you're saying, oh, you know, I need a couple of weeks to do this and that. But when you're really trying to fucking prove yourself in the beginning, it's like, I can do this and I'll do it right now. And it's like, here's value. I'm just giving you value straight up. And I think that's what like set you to the top of that immediately. Yeah, you, you have to fucking want it. You have to work and you have to make a point of difference. And I actually didn't realize at the time I had a point of difference. I just did it because I was hungry and I was thirsty. Now I'm a lazy shithead, eh? Um, no, oh, no, I'm not. I still get work done, but now I'm just like, oh, I can wait till tomorrow. I'm fucking tired. I need to sleep. I need my eight hours or I'm going to cry. I could sleep on, I could work on two hours sleep before. Yeah. And I was working full time when I was doing it. So I had to do it. I had to turn it around fast and I wanted it so bad. I wanted to be, I wanted to be Liam Underwood. Like I saw him cause he's a, you know, a few years older than me doing his stuff. I was like, I can do that. That can be me. Um, and it kind of was for a portion of time. Like I was, I was fucking, I was doing it. I was living it. I was the nightlife man. Um, which is cool. It was a cool thing. It was like a bit of an ego boost. Again, it was a dopamine hit for me. I'm just, all I'm doing my whole life is just chasing little dopamine highs. I'm a junkie for it. Like bit of gratification here, bit of praise there. Um, you know, people walking to the front of the line at a club and getting in on your night off is a fucking cool feeling. And I think that's what I was chasing. I was like, I wanted to be known. I wanted to be someone. Um, I wanted to carve out like a little path. Um, and I think I did. You did definitely. And I think coming from like Rockingham, where you're like, that's, I think even moving to the city is a big move. Dude, it, if you're from Rockingham, you know? It fully is. Like, I grew up in Rockingham. I, my childhood was great. Mum and dad, like, a spoilt little um, kid from Rockingham. Uh, definitely the most spoiled of my siblings. But I had a fucking pretty rough time growing up. You know, I was bullied. I was, I was a freak. Still am a freak. Um, so I wanted to prove to all the people, I think, growing up that I was a someone and there was a couple of moments that felt really good. Now I'm a, it makes me a little bit sad, but I was like at Jackrabbit Slims and a bunch of fucking loser jocks that used to bully me in high school came and like, oh, what are you doing so sick? Can we come out the green room? And I was like, just look in the eyes, like, fuck you. Yeah, fuck yourself and just trot it off and it felt really good. Now I'm like, you're a bit of a cunt, but uh, it felt no, really good. No, you got to get your revenge. It, it was sweet. It was, uh, it was a bittersweet moment for me because, you know, doing stuff, like I said, I was a real freak growing up. I did ballet, for God's sake from when I was three to when I was like 16 and like I was not a normal child for sure like just riding that spectrum doing all sorts of weird shit then I turned into a full emo kid so I was just like I want to prove I want to be someone I want to do something and moving out of Rockingham doing that stuff gave me 
gave me that gratification, that redemption uh, from all those things I had growing up. It gave you identity as well. It was. I think that's it. Like you're just looking when you're young, especially when you feel displaced young and you don't really know where you fit in. When you find acceptance, like that's actually quite, um, it's quite a motivator. And then it, the good thing is that you found that and then have found yourself within that and then move forward with a confidence within who you are. Yeah, I'm so glad that I did. Like I, yeah, it was, it was like, I, I was an outcast from that. I had friends, don't get me wrong. And I, but I always wanted to be the jock. I always wanted to be the popular kid. I never was. And then this was my shot at doing something that was meaningful and, you know, I could make friends again, that little, that little rush. Um, and I did it and I got it out my system and then I found out that's actually not what I wanted to be. I think I was just proving to myself that I could do it and I could be it. And I'm like, but that's not a way to live now. Um, and, you know, I used to pander to people. I used to get myself ripped off because all I wanted to do is I'm a people pleaser. That's what I am. I hate conflict. Um, I could be a bit rude and belligerent and butt heads, but I'm just a stubborn dude. But I just wanted to please people. And I think that's all I was doing during that process is being like, I'm going to try and make friends with these people, do this, do that. And then I realized I was like, no, you know what? Fuck them. Like, I'm doing this for me now. And that's what I'm doing now. It's like, it's, it's for me. And I would just want to create meaningful stuff. Josh is bashing the mic. Fucking can't get this thing in the right spot, eh? <laughs> it's driving me up the wall. I think we've succeeded though. We're fine. How are you doing? You're a bit stoned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm really, really comfortable actually. You are, yeah. You're really quiet today because you're just like, I can see that you're into it, but you're just like... <sighs> Yeah, man. Hit that oil before I came. <laughs> Dude, that stuff puts me on my ass. Bro, it's fucking so good. I feel so relaxed. I went and had a sauna today. Sweated like a motherfucker. Came home. Had some lunch. A little bit of oil. Come in, have a chat with my friends. Or listen to my friends have a chat. <laughs> That's a fucking great day. No. Both of which are vibe. So I carry on, please. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I was like, is Josh, is, is Josh grumpy? Is he, what's wrong with this? I was like, no, he's just high as shit. Yes. You know what the good thing about me and Josh is, is that we can have, like, we had a dispute earlier over booze. It was, was like, quite fucking heated, if I'm going to be honest. Yeah, but it's awesome. Like, if you can't have those heated disputes with friends, then what's the fucking point? God, we've had some fucking Barneys in our day. Yeah, but I mean, I will argue with my friends. If I won't argue with people I don't fucking give a shit about, because it's like, don't argue with fools, because... <laughs> from a distance people don't know who's who so you just pull yourself into that fucking space it's a good argument but i i solved the problem you we did prevailed. solve the problem we have a bar downstairs you see what the issue is is that josh is doing dry june and july and i am not so i was like oh you get some beers for the podcast and he was like nah <laughs> <laughs> if i'm suffering you can suffer with me um, i should be doing fucking dry uh, June and July because I'm trying to run a marathon but I'm fucking not because I'm in Perth so you know what suck me off yeah. <laughs> I'm going to regret you. this later and I'm going to deal with it now do you when you go running um, do you find like alcohol because you drink pretty regularly um, <laughs> does it does alcohol really affect you and your performance or do you find you can manage it I don't realise it when I'm drinking but when I don't like I, I took during COVID I had to stop drinking um, I took like three months off drinking I developed a little bit of a problem um, <laughs> what sort of how deep of a problem it wasn't that deep but i was probably done in a bottle of spirits a week maybe maybe a little bit less well maybe a little bit more sorry like it was very easy for me to get to 2 p.m and be like oh it's 2 p.m i could have a drink or i could uh take the toaster in the bath <laughs> um, so i can't even fathom getting through a um a whole bottle of spirits in one week at this point it's pretty easy um so i was just like no i need to stop and then i started running again you know I, I have a tumultuous relationship with running i fucking hate it anyone that joins running is a psychopath um but i do it because i feel good afterwards and i like the challenge because I, I don't like doing it so i'm just doing something i don't like to prove myself i can um so i stopped drinking and i performed exceptionally i cut a minute and a half or what was i what was i running i started off running sixes and then down to 445 tens um which is what a minute and 15 seconds i'm fucking terrible at math um, how long did it take you to get to that point probably a month and a half yeah yeah i have a fairly good you know aerobic base um for a chunkier man i'm <laughs> definitely thicker than i should be i look quite thin but i'm one of those skinny fat dudes i just like i'm i'm thin and then i have like love handles and i go thin again it's <laughs> fucking weird i hate it eh? 
um, of the body of an old lady. Uh, but yeah, alcohol does affect me for sure. Um, so when I start training for this marrow, um, I'll stop drinking altogether for the, like, the 12 weeks going into it. Um, it's just an, it, I mean, it's an inflammatory for me today. I was talking <clears throat> actually with Stefan earlier. I went, stayed down in Margaret River and went for a ride with my, on my mate's bike. He's got, he's got a fucking uh, piss rocket, like 900 uh, Super Sport Duke, an old 90s one. The thing's terrible. It's awful to ride. Um, puts you in like some kind of lean forward position. And it was, it was super uncomfortable. I'm not used to sitting like that. Then we got pissed that night. Um, red wine drunk. Woke up the next morning and my hips are in fucking, they were so inflamed. My knees are inflamed. My ankles are inflamed. I'm like... It's definitely the booze that does. I, it, does it doesn't help with recovery. Um, for and yeah, I drink regularly. I sh- should drink less, um, definitely. But yeah, you're, to answer your question, uh, I I waffle. It it definitely does affect my training for sure. Um, and just mental well being. When I stop drinking, I'm definitely a better dude for sure. But I can't do stuff by halves. Like I'm, uh, you know, God bless Rom. She's like, uh, just don't drink during the week, or just come out and have one glass of wine. I fucking can't. Eh? I just, it's just not who I am. Like, I'll have a pint now and I'll probably stop. Oh, there's another beer there, but I'll have a couple of drinks and I'll be all right now. But if the opportunity presents itself, I just, I take it. So I have to be very careful with what I choose to do. But that's the same as running. I'll run and I have to throw myself into it. First time I started running in COVID, I gave myself, it blew my knee out really bad because I did, hadn't run 10Ks for five or six years. Ran a couple of times, ran 10Ks, felt really good, ran 10Ks the next day and fucking just blew my knee out. Adam was sitting there messaging me being like, don't go for a run tomorrow. Give yourself a rest, you've deserved it. I'm like, no, I can do it. No one can stop me. Next minute, my knees are the size of a fucking balloon and I'm hobbling around for like, I had to take like six weeks off. Um, but now I've got some good friends uh, that are helping coach me. Adam's been really good um, training with me. Shout out to a couple other people like Will Ox and... Shinners who I ran the half marrow with, um, they're good people. And I just do it because I just need to move. I need to do something that's good for my mental health. And, um, you know, they, they say that, what is it? Uh, training calms your mind and meditation trains your mind. It's the other way around for me. It's like training, like it, it trains my mind. Like I have to do it or I'm fucked. I found the same, man. Like I've just been moving house this week and it's just been a shit show. And I've been on this... I'm about 15 weeks in. I mean, I did like a 12 week sort of training thing, but then I did, um, I'm just kind of continuing it and it, it keeps going. And this week I took four days off cause my back's been real sore and I was moving house. So it was just like such a fucking drama. A moving house is always an absolute shit show anyway, but it just, I haven't felt that bad in so long like i was just like gassed out i was just fucking knackered just super foggy decision making was terrible feeling like quite down and then last night i just dragged myself to the gym which i'd been doing five to six times a week for the last sort of 14 weeks and i felt instantly better and it's like it just occurs to me that if i don't have that in my life like if i don't have a for josh's jiu-jitsu um and for me at the moment it's just going to the gym and it was running for a while as well. It's like, without that, Delby spoke about it on his podcast and it's something that I was a big takeaway from me. It was like, you, there's a number of cogs and you need to keep those cogs spinning. And you can't, we come from a, we come from like an industry and like a work ethic where it's like, it's just sprints. It's like, right, forget your whole life except for this one thing that you need to do now and get it out. And it's like, that's fine. It's good to have that within yourself. But if you live your life that way, it com- everything just fucking crumbles all the time. Dude, it, <clears throat> I'm bad with it. Like, I'll just be like, I'm working, I'm working 12 hours today and go home, eat, come back, work the 12 hours. I don't take enough time to do it for me. Don't take enough time out to hang out with Rom, those kind of things. And I'm, I'm learning, I'm, I'm trying to get better at doing it, but you just have to, you just have to do it. And I'm the biggest hypocrite. I don't practice what I preach, but I know I need to do it. I know I need to fucking just get up and I have to run in the morning. Um, you know, I... I'll crash in the afternoon or if, if I run too late, I can't sleep because I'm full of fucking endorphins. I'm like, woo, let's go. Um, so I have to train in the morning and doing it and doing that half marrow was the, it sounds so silly. It's fucking such a pathetic distance now. And I know that like people are like, be so proud of yourself. I'm like, no, nah, fuck that. I did it. Uh, like I'm so proud of doing it though. Mm. Um, Cause I've never done anything like that before. I've never, you know, post, you know, being younger and doing some sport and stuff like that i've never really made an achievement like that and it felt i was the same i did the i did a half that we did the rottenest half marathon and i was just like i completed it and i was like i never thought i'd be able to do that 
And even though, like, I don't know, we've sort of talked about me and Ben have spoke about doing it again, but I don't know. I don't have the same drive for it now. It was cool. We did it for like leukemia and shit like that, and it was a it was a cool thing to do. Um, but I'm also 40 years old. And I'm not an athlete. Like, I'm in relatively good shape, but I'm definitely not a fucking athlete. You know I'm the I mean? same, like, dude. I'm fucking... I've, I've abused my body. I was 90 kilos at one point. I was a fat piece of shit. And then I was... I took weight loss too far. I got down to, like, fucking 57 kilos. I was a fucking skeleton. I looked, People asked me if I had cancer. Like, I looked... <laughs> I'm not even joking. I remember going into an event one day and someone's like... Is, is everything all right with your health, man? Like, is there something going on? I'm like, no, I'm really healthy. I'm, I, I was so, I was so fatigued all You're the like, time. I've got this, I've got this fucking thing where I can just eat anything and then I just vomit and it's good. Like, yeah, it's bul- like, shout out to bulimia. No, I don't, I don't know. I shouldn't glorify eating disorders and I don't. Dude, I watched that. Um, I posted about it the other day because I reckon once a year I watched the Amy Winehouse movie. You ever seen it? No, weird flex, but. Oh, dude, it's, it's, it's not a flex. It's fucking brilliant. Like it's. It's, I was never like a huge Amy Winehouse fan when she was alive. And because for some reason, I thought that she was doing covers. She sounds like a cover artist. I'll give you that. But even though Rehab is obviously clearly like a modern day song, for some reason, I was just like, it it sounds like a 1960s, it it sounds like a 1960s cover of a song that she's done really well. I, I, I get that. And then I watched the documentary years ago and it's the most, it's the, the, the best documentary I think I've ever seen. And I was just like, in that they interview her parents and her parents, it's her mom and her mom is like, it's like a, a bunch of different interviews that have happened over time. And she, the mom literally says that. She goes, oh yeah, when she was 15, she told me that like, she'd realized that she could eat anything that she wanted. And as long as she threw up, she wouldn't put on weight. And she's like, oh, we didn't think much of it. You know, we thought she'd just grow out of it. And then she ends up like an alcoholic and a fucking addicted to crack and stuff. And then she eventually dies. But in that whole documentary, it's just like, even her songs, she's, they're literal, like every part of it. Like that, try to make me go to rehab. My dad says I'm fine. That's literally what happened. Like, and it goes through it in the documentary and you're just like, oh, you were literally just documenting your life. And she was just falling apart from the get go. Man, I always joke around and say it, and I say it with Adam, and I'm quite a dark person if you haven't already figured it out, but man, I'm one bad day away from a crack addiction, hey? Like, I could definitely become like a heroin or a fucking meth addict, for sure. Like, I know that I have that demon in me. It's fucking there, and it's just knocking at my door constantly. It's What's like, the, let's fucking go. Do you have an addiction, or do you have like a vice that you are ashamed of in that sense? No, I should do less drugs. I really should. Mm. Um, I don't. I, I don't say I'm addicted to anything per se. I don't have a crippling addiction. You know, I've I've done everything. I've fucking when I was I used to sell cars. Dude, I've done some shit. Eh? I used to sell cars, smoke forty fucking cigarettes a day when I was like twenty one. Sorry, mum. Like again, I had a bit of a drinking problem. I don't now. I've got it under control. Like I've never had a drug problem. You know, I, I don't go out and do coke on a weeknight. You don't need drugs. I don't need drugs. I don't go out and do coke on a weeknight, but I just have an addictive personality and I know that demon is there. Like, I don't know, if something happens tomorrow and fucking Rom leaves me and all my friends die in a house fire or something like that, I'm going straight down to the corner and getting a point. eh? I'm just being like, (laughs) fucking see you later. I'll be a vagrant on the street. But that's why I have to do stuff like force myself to run, do the... I did that half marathon with a fucking flu. I thought I was going to die. Like, I thought I had COVID. Like, I was the sickest I've ever fucking been in my life. I woke up and be like, don't run. And I ran. I did it. I got halfway through. It was like a warm Melbourne day. I was running. Got to 15Ks. I was running with this guy I'd only just met. And I was like, how nice is this breeze, man? He was like, what breeze? I was like, it's so nice in your skin. And I looked down. I had goosebumps. My joints like, I was like, oh, I got the chills, bro. <laughs> and then I walked the last fucking 6Ks nearly <laughs> dying and doing it. But I just had to do it. But it's like, yeah, I... I have that demon in me. My grandparents were alcoholics um, on my dad's side. They, and they went sober. They cleaned up. They did it. And I, I know it runs in my family. Like, I know it's, it's just there. It's like this shadow that's behind me. And it sounds grim to say it out loud, but I just, I, don't, I just know it deep down inside. So I do have to be careful with what I do because I take everything to the nth degree. And I don't know whether it's an ADD thing or ADHD or whatever the fuck, it, like, whatever I have autism or I'm, I'm an, I'm, like if the spectrum's a rainbow I'm every fucking colour right? yeah. um, 
but it's there and it's just deep inside me so I really have to keep myself in check like it sounds really silly I've got fucking fingernails for the first time in 30 years because I'm a compulsive fingernail biter um so it's just it's there and it's chasing me and I'm just trying not to let it catch me and I won't let it catch me but like I do joke around quite deeply about it though because I could I see that guy in the street and I'm like I, I get it people become addicts because it's fucking good like I didn't no, no get one, it. no I one didn't... would shoot heroin if it sucked I didn't get it until I, until I broke my wrist and I was on Oxycontin, I spoke about it on here before. And yeah, that Oxycontin romance of just oblivion, of just sitting on a couch and it being the best moment of your life. I was like, oh my God, I understand. Like, and apparently heroin's better than that. So it's fucking tough. Like I, I, ne- I definitely never understood addiction until that. And I remember the moment that it happened and I was just like, oh my God, like everything, everything melts away. I didn't have like a lot of problems in my life or anything like that. And I was prescribed this stuff because I had pins and wires running through my fucking body. But I definitely had never understood how people could get to that point before. And then I watched like documentaries now about, um, about Oxycontin and watched, did you see Dope Sick? No, I haven't watched that oh, yet. It's great. It's like a dramatized series about it. But there was just a ton of people that got addicted to Oxycontin, um, addicted to opiates by design because that's what the pharmaceutical company wanted to happen. And then the government stepped in and essentially banned it. And they just left a bunch of people that were completely reliant on opioids. And they all just moved on to heroin. And that's why like, heroin's such a massive problem. It is here now as well. It's fucking crazy. It's in Melbourne pretty bad. I mean, I don't know that for a fact. I'm not fucking the authority on it. But I feel like Melbourne, it's definitely worse. Like you see people in the nod way more than you did in Perth. There's less psycho crackheads running You've been around. away for a while, dude. It is <laughs> It's bad. here too. Like, like in this area where we're in now, like um, King Street, Queen Street, it's fucking very bad. Yeah, I, f- I feel like I see... <clears throat> people on the nod more in Melbourne than you do like crazy crackheads running around like with their shirt off fucking drinking milk in the street and shit like it's less it's there but I feel like it's less prevalent um but yeah addiction for me I mean I guess I saw it growing up I never really understood that my grandparents had like a drinking problem um but it was when I was older and I started trying hard drugs and doing that stuff I think I realized without no without realized without actually making a conscious um, you know, internal dialogue with myself. And I was like, this could be a problem for me. Like the first time I did anything, I was like, that was fucking sick. And I want, the only thing I want to do when I do it is more of it. Mm. And that's not good. There's people like that, man. I have a friend, I won't say his name, um, but we went to, we went out one night and he was, I think he was about 19. He's like an athlete. And we went out for like a, it was someone's box party. And he tried Molly and Coke for the first time. And we just had this like massive bender of a night. It was just a relatively, you know, like it was, it wasn't, I wasn't doing Molly and cocaine like super regularly, but a few times a year you'd go out and you'd have kind of a blowout and everyone's having a good time. And we'd all got back to my house and he said, why don't people just do this all the time? And we all looked at each other and we're like, oh no. Like, yeah. <laughs> What have we you fucking have, done? Yeah, dude, that was exactly it. We were like, what have we done? Because he was young. I think I was only maybe 26, 27 at the time. But it was like the majority of people will try that sort of stuff and like have a little bit of a romance with it over at that sort of period of in their 20s, you know. But then some people are like, they find that and they just go, oh, this is how I want to feel all the time. Yeah, and I, I find it hard because I'm around it probably a lot more than a lot of people just with the nature of my work. Mm. Um, so I've got to be careful. That, that's what it comes down to is I have to be conscious with it and I've learned how to say no and enjoy yourself not drinking. But also doing... I won't ever shame anyone for fucking doing it because, like, if you can do it and not get addicted to it, fucking all the power to you, dude. Like, it's not... You know, there's all dangers inherent, but there's dangers inherent with everything. Like, this this is the worst shit in the fucking world. Like, sh- should be no less or more legal than other stuff. I mean, maybe, maybe no, don't legalize less heroin, but uh, you get what I mean. Like, it causes just as many fucking problems. So anyone that shames someone for doing drugs is a fucking hypocritical asshole, hey? Like, I don't, I don't fuck with that. Just, 
you know, maybe if you're doing it and ruining your life, yeah, but if, you know, people are like, oh, I don't fuck with anyone that touches drugs, like, don't shame them for it. But also, I've, I've got a lot of friends that are straight edge, don't drink, you know, big athletes, like Adam's fucking doesn't do much stuff. He'll have a blowout. We have fucking great blowouts and fucking really good parties, but knows when to say no, knows mm. when to say yes and do it. So I, I think that's really important. So I've just got to, I've got to be careful. And I think a lot of creatives are the same. Like, I don't know many creatives that don't have some kind of, I won't say addiction, but some kind of vice or, um, you know, neurological predisposition to be like, that shoot was a success. Let's get a bag. <laughs> like, I don't know. I can't name anyone that's not like that at all. Or if you're you like, name me, bro. Cause <laughs> I've like, I've never been the bad guy. You have not been the no. bad guy. I mean, Molly Mella, but. Oh, yeah, by all guy. means, and I got nothing bad to say about Molly. But that if you don't, thing, but that's but the thing, I, you don't like it, you don't like it, that's it. Fuck I it. had an agreement with my, I've always been pretty good when it comes to drugs. Like, I'm not a fucking, I'm, I don't really fucking get down that way. Like, I don't know if it's an ADHD thing, but cocaine doesn't work. I don't, no, cocaine does nothing for me. And I, I don't has. think it does anything to me. It just, it's again, dopamine hit. You're like, that was cool. Uh, it just but kind of you're not like aggressive and want more cocaine. And then I'm like, well, I don't really enjoy this anyway. But with Molly, me, but I, I found that like, switch off. I found I was like, it just made me enjoy everything exponentially more. I could just kind of sit there and listen to music and all that sort of stuff, you know, in a social setting. But I'd always thought, I'd always, I always knew that there is a chemical come down on the back end of, of drugs. And if I had nothing that was lingering and I had a long period of my life where I had nothing that was lingering, I was like, I could do that come down where I would feel my brain trawling for problems. Like I'd feel my brain going, you should be worried about this. And I'd, I'd be like, ah, I can see what you're doing. And then as soon as it was when dad got sick, I was like, I know that that's going to find some shit now. And I know that it's going to alter me and I know that it's going to fuck with me internally. And I just kind of stopped. And I never have really gone... I, I, haven't, I don't think I've done it in, in years. And I assume that's just what happens, right? Like people, you do drugs in your 20s and then in your 30s, there does come a point where it's like logging into MSN Messenger for the last time. There is a point where you logged into MSN Messenger for the last or you logged out of MSN Messenger for the last time. You didn't realize it at the time. You just realized that a num that a, the number of years had passed or something and, and everyone had moved on. And that's why if you are still going and still partying in that way and, and much respect to anyone and everyone has their own path. But for me, I was just like, I don't really, there hasn't been a circumstance where I've been like, that's what I want to do. And also I remember around that time, like, but even prior to that, I was like, I'm never going to do drugs to try and reach people's level. You know, when you rock up to places and people are fucking on one and you're like, uh, I'm not really connecting here. And the only way to connect is to like do a line or something and then jump, jump on board and jump into the party. Let's start a business. I was like, bro. I'm not going to do this. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I'm not going to do that because it feels like the wrong reason. But if I was in a situation where I was having a really good time and that presented itself, I would go, <clears throat> Oh yeah. Like I can, I can roll with that. But I was never like, I, I need to do this in order to fit into what's going on. Here. Yeah. And I was always pretty aware of that. I'm definitely trying to do that now. Like if an opportunity presents itself and it's, beneficial to the circumstance and I can deal with the repercussions in a healthy way and I can manage them and I can afford to take the next it's never a day it's fucking three days yeah. we call we call them Westgate Wednesdays um because you go on a Saturday night have a big one and come Wednesday you want to throw yourself off the Westgate bridge <laughs> um like if I can deal with it I'll do it but now I'm just like I'm, I'm, I'm keeping myself in check Rom's keeping me in check Adam's a fucking really good he's like cunt don't do that don't be a fucking moron um, and doing that, can we can we go back to the? Uh, have you told Josh? We can this, go anywhere, bro. Have we told Josh the story about the time that you tricked me into thinking that I took drugs and I spent twelve hours? Oh, not twelve hours. It was like probably fucking an hour and a half, completely paranoid at a music festival that I was gonna die. <laughs> I fucking swear that sounds familiar, but I can't. I can't recall. So please. I fuck, I used to fuck with Finny, oh, you're like my little brother. Yeah, and we went to. I was. It was a music festival in Joondalup and um, it was, I think it was Listen, Listen Out. Listen Out 20, 
Ooh, what, when did we move? 28. So it would have been 2016, 2017 that it was. <laughs> um, I was running the media for Listen Out. So I was like, I was on the camera, but a little bit less than normal, but I was still managing stages on, you know, the radio. Your job was important. Yeah, it was. It wasn't just click record. Yeah. It was managing a team of five or six people, making sure everyone had to be where they had to be. So there's some pretext there. So Jeremy was, Jeremy was playing at a festival like early on and I wasn't, I, I think I wasn't in a great mood, but I was just like, I'm not really that bothered. I just went with him just to hang out and um, we're cruising around and we had like triple A passes. So I was just walking around the backstage area watching, I think I just watched Mac Miller play or something. Yeah, it was the last time Mac Miller came to, yeah. uh, so whatever year that was. I found that photo as well and I kind of forgot that I was there and it was kind of eerie seeing, it was like a film photo that I took of him playing and I was like, because they kicked us off the backstage. I wasn't allowed to film it. Really, it kind of upset me now that I'm thinking about it. I was like, it would be cool just to say that I did a bit of work and did all that stuff. Yeah, and it was like, we would, we'd just come back. I think Pinau were about to play and I was with Jeremy. And we I'm sorry, I'm laughing because now it's funny, but at the time it fucking, it sucked so much. This is so good because I thought nothing of it. So like, I had a Red Bull and I never fucking drink Red Bull. And it was a huge one. It was yeah, like one was of those like a, fucking half Someone had just up. fucking given it to me and I was like, uh, yeah, I'm pretty tired. So I took this Red Bull and um, we get on the back of a golf cart <clears> and <throat> Finney's on there and he goes, he goes, I'll give you some of that. And he just grabs the fucking Red Bull off me. No questions asked and just I, I chuck like a half prick. Of it. Yeah, just to jug half of it. And I was like, dude, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and he's like, what? And I played it out really well because I didn't, immediately say it and Jeremy kind of played along which was cool I was like dude fuck how much of that did you drink <laughs> and he's like I know I need to lead him in like slowly like how much did you drink I was and like not like, that much not and that then much. you shook the can and I, I'm like dude this is like you I was like man that is fucking got like half a gram of molly in it <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, are you fucking kidding me? I was like, dude, I didn't fucking, I, I didn't ask you to drink it. You took it off me. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, I'm not working. You're fucking working, dude. Like, like I was properly in character. And you just fucking drove and off I in just the buggy. Left. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wandering around the fucking music festival with my radio and my camera for about 90 minutes waiting for it to kick in. I was still working, but this paranoia in the back of my head saying, it's gonna because you know sometimes you don't know because you're like you're getting the heat from the fucking Red Bull anyway, so you're like, oh no, and you can psych yourself in and out of those. And I've done a bunch of caffeine. I've been there since fucking. You load in at like six a.m. It's fucking late at night by that time, so you're pretty wired. And it's just the back of my head. I'm just waiting because you know sometimes you do stuff, drinking drugs, whatever, and it might not hit you for a fucking hour. And I'm like, it's gonna fucking come. And I mess it. And I was fucking messaging Scott, abusing and being like, you fucking piece of shit. Fuck you. Where are you? Freaking out. And then like 90 minutes later, he messaged, haha, joking. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucked, dude. Like I've never been, my anxiety was, and I'm an anxious person. I was looking for my fucking meds in my bag. Like, what am I going to do? I'm going to get fucking fired. I'm going to pass out on stay. I'm going to shit myself. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what else going through my head, but it was just absolute like abject fear. Terror. For my right, but life. in fairness, like how beautiful did it feel when you realized I was joking? Oh. The relief. It was the, the, but it was, the, the day was over by the time you fucking told me I was packing up. And it was one of the worst festival experiences of my entire fucking life. I'll tell you that much for free. <laughs> it was not good at all. Uh, I'm not even sorry. That's yeah. a great, that, that's a great story. <laughs> fucking fantastic story. I tell heaps of people that and I'm just like, be careful who you drink from. Like, <laughs> you don't know what they got in it because it's a fucking thing. You know what the best thing about that is? Like, I just never thought about it again. <laughs> Like if you didn't bring that, you brought that story up with me the other week and I was like, oh yeah, that's just something that happened. I think about it more regularly than I should, to be honest. Like it's, you know, when you're lying in bed, it's fucking, you can't get to sleep and you think about that time that, I don't know, you did something in grade three that was so embarrassing that no one will ever think about again. That is one of the times I think about that all the time and I'm like, God, he must've thought I was a fucking loser. I, all the, like I've, I've, well, I, you think that I thought you were a loser. Oh, like, no, not a loser, but just a dickhead. Be like, like, I'm thinking Scott telling people this story to embarrass me, like, all the time. Like, every time you meet a stranger, you're like, I tricked Sean into thinking that he took drugs nah. once. You've never thought about it again. Nah. But I think about it. <laughs> no, I know. Oh, it it plagues my dream. Your mind, yeah. Rent free. It has, look, it has a fucking three by two in fucking Ellenbrook in my mind. <laughs> like, rent free, fucking off the plan. It's I just used to do fucked there. up shit, though. Like, and I, it's still within me. Like, I told this at my brother's wedding, like, 
my brother copped it the worst because he was younger than me. I used to do this to friends. I would just tell them facts that were completely wrong, but very believable and then just never correct them. So I told my brother that, cause he said something about John Butler not being very good. And I was like, yeah, John Butler's fucking terrible. I was like, you understand like the John Butler story, right? And he's like, what are you talking about? And I, he was only 12, 14 years old. And I was like, John Butler's parents are like mining magnates. He wanted to be a musician and he was failing. So they made a chain of retail stores that was just unbeatable. And then they distributed his music through JB Hi-Fi. And that's why he's famous. And it's John Butler Hi-Fi. And he's just like, really? Dude, this trader Scott actually has spawned a fun travel game called Unhistorical Places. <laughs> And it's where you walk past something very historical and very well known and then tell the other person <laughs> what it is completely not. <laughs> For example, walking past the, like, the Reichstag in Berlin, Scott's like, so Josh, on the left here, you'll see that we have uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's old house. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just, but it, the, the trick is just to leave it. That's the art of it. The art of it is to give disinformation and then just continue on as if there's, not, as, as if there's nothing else. <laughs> I, I, love, I love a long-term ruse. I'll say something in the group chat and we'll just leave it. And then Adam will know or someone will know I'm lying and we'll say something a week later and back it up. But it's got to be perfect, an art for flawlessly it. casual. First of all, you have to believe your own lie. The other main trick is remembering your lie because if you forget your lie, that's when you get caught. <laughs> I think about stories like that with the John Butler thing. Surely that's got back to John Butler and he's heard it one day and been like, what the fuck? <laughs> Who the fuck is saying that about me? And now that's your brother's- a believable a, story. John brother, Butler's fucking terrible. Now your brother's a mortal enemy of John Butler. <laughs> and he, and he, he doesn't know why. And he just has this beef with him for no reason. Like he walks down the street and John Butler coward punches him or something. And it was like, fuck you. Why are you telling this lie about me? Dude, I, growing up, everyone was just like, John Butler, you know, he was a busker in Fremantle. It was like the modern success story of, of music. And I was just like, he still sounds like a fucking dude that plays on the street in Fremantle to me. Like Ze it just sounds Zebra. like someone that's got a fucking kick drum, Zebra and like bro. a harmonica in his mouth and just playing and singing about random shit that's going on around him. It's like folk walk music, really. Fuck John Butler. <laughs> To be fair, I can't remember the last time. We can I've debate ever. it, bro. Like, I know, I no, no, I'm not a John Butler fan. I can't remember the last time I've listened to John Butler. I know the Zong Zebra and that's it. I swear, like, yeah, I will. I will I just and I, ju that. I if just dude, fucking If you have did. a chorus of, a, of your major song that goes, dun, 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 like that. Dude, it's, it's, that's Jack, a jo it's Jack Johnson from Freo. This is very true. And it's quintessentially Australian as well, West Australian. I don't know, there's something about it. It sounds, there's a, I don't know how to describe it, but it sounds like every other Australian band that's kind of made it. Like Eskimo Joe kind of sounds the same as fucking John Butler, as all the other. It's Dude, just the a Cat Empire. I feel the same way about all of them. What is the Cat Empire? I don't really understand it. Like, are there like 47 like a people in the band? Or is it like. some jazz thing of people that. To me, the Cat Empire, what was that song that, hello, you remember that song? <laughs> mm -hmm. To me, that is, was just like a precursor for um, Macklemore's <laughs> thrift shop. Like it was all the same shit. Fuck that, dude. It was just like, fuck all of this. It's terrible music. Speaking of tidbits of Australiana, you just mentioned, I just remembered then, this is, this is going to go nowhere, but you just have to hear it. <laughs> you ever heard of Trough Man? No. No. So Trough Man in the 70s and 80s, he discovered his affinity for water sports. So what Trough Man would do in the 70s and 80s and go, is go to bars and lie down in the trough and have people urinate on him. Man, I was Trough Man as a kid. I got fucking put into the trough at the school. I got bullied. I got oh, you, were, you were involuntarily Trough Man. Yeah, I got Trough Man. I got fucking milkshaked into the fucking... This is really embarrassing story. I'm going to get, get bullied for this. I've never told anyone this. I got fucking milkshaked into the fucking urinal trough when I was in like grade four or What's some shit. What's a milkshake? When someone grabs you from like your hands and then your arms and then like fucking oh, tosses okay. you into the fucking trough. Wow. I got trough man. <laughs> I got trough man. Let's start a, let's start a, like a, a, it's a thing now getting trough man. <laughs> so hang on, was trough man a person or is this a, no, is it person. folklore? Is this an urban no. legend? Yeah. There's a photo of him on the internet if you Google him. And it was a Perth thing? No, Sydney. We should get trough man on here. He's big oh. in the Mardi Gras scene. You know, the, 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 the only time I've ever been, the only time I've ever been knocked out was on my 21st birthday. I had this friend, Croy, um, who I used to play in a band with, and he's, he's a character of a man. And basically, we were at Bar 120, where all good 21sts happen. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there, brother. 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, I rolled in there and the night's going fine. And I go to the bathroom and I'm taking a piss and I can hear this fucking voice that's really familiar to me. And he's going, just get, just get us some fucking toilet paper. I'm standing at the urinal pissing and there's two other dudes standing there next to me. And he seems to be directing... Basically, Croy is sitting in a cubicle with the door open, holding his shirt down, and there's obviously no fucking toilet paper. So he's made the cardinal sin of going for a number two at a nightclub. <laughs> Barling anyway, 20 of all places. Yeah, exactly. And he's an antagonistic dude, so he's just fucking yelling at this guy. And this dude's kind of fucking with him. The dude's like, oh, were you taking a shit in a nightclub for? You know, like the, the typical sort of thing. No one knows that me and him know each other. And it's just me and him that are in the bathroom that know each other and there's like three other people. So I'm pissing and I said, oh, dude just wants to wipe his ass, man. Trying to fucking lighten the mood a little bit because I can see that it's going in a negative direction. And then the guy's finished pissing, looks at me and he's like, what are you going to do about it sort of thing? Like he like postures towards me. I finish and the guy lunges at me. Like he's like mad dogging me, lunges at me. And it wasn't some skilled move. I just happened to move out of the direction at the right time and parry him off. And he landed arm down in the, in the <laughs> urinal. So like completely... You trough manned him. Yeah, <laughs> completely, completely trough manned him, right? And then I've gone, well, this is a fucking fine time to leave the bathroom because this is just going to get fucking out of control. Croy's not going to help me. He's fucking predisposed. He's a mud butt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one's fought in that situation. So I walk out of the toilet and the first person I see is this dude, Haggis, right? This guy, this Scottish guy we knew. And he's a big dude. He looked like he kind of modeled himself on Vin Diesel. I walked straight into him and I said, a couple of dudes ganging up on Croy inside. We need to go in and get him out. And to me, I'm like, I'm with Haggis. Haggis is a bad man. Like, it's going to be fine. So we walk back in and they're straight into these two dudes who are still sort of going at it with Croy. And one of them looks at me and he goes, you brought some backup. And I was like, man, we're just trying to get my friend some toilet paper. It's all good. I just, I just walked past the guy, lights out. <laughs> so wait, you got piss fisted. <laughs> Basically what had happened is I'd walk past the guy and he's just lined up my jaw from like this sort of angled on behind and he's just punched me. And according to Haggis, like apparently I got up about a second and a half after I'd been knocked out and just walked out and continued my night. Like I had no idea what had happened and I started getting that weird recall. So I was like asking everyone what had happened. When my memory had come back, we're sitting outside the club. I've got my idiot girlfriend at the time fucking sitting next to me crying. And I'm like, yo, can you just tell me what happened? And she's like, shut up, <laughs> shut the fuck up. You know, like, because of, I'd just been asking it on repeat. Cause when you get knocked out, you get that like fucking constant recall. And then Haggis walks over and he's just bleeding profusely from the eye. <laughs> and it was like, what ended up happening was, yeah, I'd gone in thinking it was all good. Some dudes just punched me in the back of the head, knocked me out, I bailed. And these two dudes just beat the shit out of Haggis. <laughs> God bless. Man, I'm so lucky I haven't been knocked out at a club. Hey, I've had a few close calls with like taking photos of people like, you can't take my photo and like being staunched out and stuff. But I've been really lucky to this day. I've not been knocked out at or fight. I'm a fucking coward. I can't find my way out of a wet paper bag. Eh? I'm, I'm being really lucky. I got knocked out at Soundwave once. Um, <laughs> I think it was a bit of bleeding through. I got kicked straight in the face, like full donkey kick and just fucking lights out, woke up in the tent later. And paramedics were terrible back then. I got let out like five minutes later, just fucking run loose again. Just and I patch was like, you up. Just well, like, you're all right. Have a drink of water. Slap you on the ass and fucking off you go, son. You know, fucking enjoy the rest of the show. Uh, yeah, that's the only time like I'm, I've, I've had a, f a few close calls. Actually, I got greatest club story ever. Let's and you, you know this story. Or not the greatest, but it's pretty funny. I was shooting for a... Rapper, um, I don't know if I name names for the rapper, but let's just fucking yeah. So I was dude, they're not listening. Yeah, I was shooting for YG. I got this call up from Nick Brady. Shout out to Nick Brady, the worst human, best human ever. Um, respect to Nick Brady. Respect to Nick Brady. Do you want to go shoot this? Do you want to go shoot YG? And I was like, F I was. God, this was a long time ago. I would have been 19, 20 at the time, so ten years ago, something like that. It was playing Metro City. And he was like, do you want to go shoot it? I have this guy I know, he's a promoter. He's throwing the after party. Um, you know exactly the promoter I'm talking about. Um, and then we get there and there's a bomb threat. So we're standing outside talking. I'm on World Star. Look up YG 
Perth World Star Hip Hop. I'm on World Star standing next to YG and Ty Dolla Sign. Ty Dolla Sign's complimenting me on my fucking top knot and all sorts of weird shit. We, and he's like, oh, you're the photographer, blah, blah, blah. We end up going back in playing the show. He's like, oh, okay, you're with us. You don't have a pass. Come hang out, do all this stuff. Shoot the show, goes really well. I take terrible photos because I was not very good back then. Um, hang out. He was cool. He's like, YG's a really nice dude for a man who's fucking scary as fuck. He's a nice dude. Go and go leave the venue, standing in the little back alley at Metro uh, City, and it's really late by this stage. The show's gone over time by like two, three hours, some shit like that. And they were meant to have an after party that was promised by said promoter that I was there on behalf of. And Ty Dollar Sign had a, sorry, Ty Dollar Sign, YG had a support rapper with him. I can't remember his name, but he was a scary dude, throat tattoos, the day he landed back in LA. He oh, it was Slim. Was 400? Slim 400? Yeah, yeah, I think he's it was. dead now. What? Yeah, yeah, he died. Oh, rest in peace. Well, yeah. man nearly killed me. Um, we were standing in the back entrance and he was like, oh, they found out the after party's not happening. And that was a fucking uproar because they would have got promised, I don't know how much money, but what, what's an after show? Five, 10 grand, something yeah, like that, cash? Grand, yeah. yeah. They got promised the after show. And I was on the door list as the name of this promoter who promised him the after party. It obviously wasn't me, but I was a promoter. He was like, you're, I can't remember the guy's name, but you're John Smith. He's like, you're John. I was like, no, nah, I'm Sean. He's like, no, nah, you're John. So like, you're John. He's like, you owe me 10 grand or whatever the figure was. And I was like, I, I, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Like standing there with my camera, this top knotted neck bearded looking fucking freak wearing. I was wearing like a XL, like AS color T. I, I, I was a dickhead. Eh? Um, and he's standing me and he was like, you owe us fucking money. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, the after party's not happening. You promised this. But I was like, dude, I'm the photographer. I don't know what you're talking about. He grabs me by the throat and like, Slim 400 is tiny, but like picks me up and pushes me against the wall. And the security come up next to me. Their security, they're fucking huge. Rapper security, the biggest human beings you've ever seen. And they're grabbing my camera and being like, how much is this worth? How much money have you got in your wallet? What are your shoes worth? Like full, like gonna fucking rob me then yg walks out i was like what the fuck's going on he was like this is it. he's like no that's not him his name's sean he's fine and then like they let me go and then they leave i was fully in fear for my fucking life that night i've never been so scared like i've had some you know i grew up in rockingham i've had some shitty encounters but that night i've never been so these guys were shirt fronting cops in the street when they were shutting it down they would have had if he didn't turn up I would have lost my camera, lost my wallet, probably been fucking coward punched into a coma or stabbed or some shit. But yeah, shout out to that promoter. You're a fucking dumb cunt. Eh? <laughs> Fuck you, you fucking piece of shit. We both know his name, bro. We do. <laughs> we do. I'm not saying his name because that will Fuck fucking that come man. back to haunt me. But fucking, that was the scariest club. Exciting story now. But that, I was fully shook, eh? And then ever since then, I was very careful with club nights with due diligence. Mm. who am I shooting for why am I there where are these photos going who's the after party for like all these kind of shit I was very very careful from that moment on because it's a fucking dog eat dog world and you will get thrown in the fucking fire thrown to the fucking wolves man that Dude. shit it's so crazy because it's like it's it's relatively high intensity in those things and there's there's generally you have like because I've worked with a bunch of rappers as well generally you have the rapper and then you have someone on his entourage, which is basically just trying to make money. So they're, they're the ones that are like $5,000 for a fucking appearance. And they'll rock up at like nine different nightclubs and shit like that. So it's, there's always a lot going on. And it's a totally different side. Like we can all sit here and watch like Chicago drill videos and like be like, oh, this is entertaining. It's a, it, there's a distance between you and that. Like when you're in in that sort of situation. I've seen it happen so many fucking times. Dude, it was the first time I think maybe I put two and two together. I'm like, these aren't just rappers. These are fucking bad men. Like who shakes down a strange fucking barely legal kid for their fucking camera and gets their wallet out and checks how much fucking ca I didn't have fucking brass. I was shooting the show for free. I cut my teeth doing the whole exposure is going to put food on my table shit. Like yeah. I had no, my camera was worth maybe $500 it was a piece of shit. Like I don't even know what it was. It sucked and it scared the living shit out of me. Like it was, and it makes the encounter sound like it was a really long time. It wasn't. The whole encounter probably lasted for a minute, but it felt like a fucking the lifetime. Shit that informs you, and man. also I'm a coward too. So I, I bet if it was someone else, like, you know, come up to Josh, Josh fucking, I don't know, Iminari leg rolls them and fucking breaks <laughs> their leg or some shit. But me, I'm just like, 
I'm terrified. I, I, I can't fight. I can't do anything. I can't defend myself. And I was fucking terrified. But I also ended up on World Star. So, you know. That's it. World S- Star. World Star. <laughs> Swings and roundabouts, baby. Swings and roundabouts. You got glassed. I did get glassed, yeah. Where? On my face. Well, I know. No, I meant venue, not on your body, huh. you dickhead. Well, that. <laughs> You I don't assume know, you which, gla- you, which you'd assume you were asking where you said where. Well, I mean, you, most people don't glass you in your Earth. arm. Yeah, but people don't la- glass you in your arm. Let's be fair. If you get well, glass in the face. Possibly if you're like defending, get stabbed in the thing. I'd get stabbed in the Defensive face straight away. Wound. It was similar to Scott, actually, um, without the, the trough manning. But, but um, it was Leopold Hotel on Canning Highway in Ardross, I guess yeah, it I is. Yeah, I like the Leo. Bateman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was young, like 21, I think. And... Um, Okay. So walked into the bathroom. There was a kid I knew in there. I knew his brother, and I knew him kind of by, by default, not not super close. But he he looked at me with this look on his face and was like, he, "Like help me! I don't know these dudes in there. Like claiming I owe money." It was such a weird thing. So it was like, hopefully you did. Yeah. So I, was, I just like tried to to quell the argument. I was like, "Look, chill. Like he he doesn't owe you any money. Let's just fuck off." And um. The dude, there was two dudes in there. One of the dudes like pushed me back into this kid that I knew. So I was standing kind of between them. And my dad, I don't know why, you, you know, when you're pissed and sh- something happens like that, it just slows down. I was like, my dad told me once, if someone puts their hands on you, it's going to end up in a fight. So fucking hit him. Once someone pushes you with that kind of violence, it's going to, you, you, <coughs> you're going. So I pop straight back up and I hit him in square in the jaw. And he kind of falls off to the side. But his mate that was standing behind him had an empty pint in his hand and just went smash straight into the side of my face. Now, he still had like the bottom half of it and he kind of like swung at me again with it. So he caught me just in the neck, like just grazed me. But it went all the way down the underside of my eyelid, down the side of my temple here and then like through my eyelid. Um, it was like 20 odd stitches or something, 25 stitches because it was in the face. Like they were going to give me a transfusion in the ambulance on the way. It's pretty badass. A, a fucking, how's this for serendipitous though? My mum was actually a cop at the time and my mum heard about it because it got f- called in. So my mum hears about Josh, uh, whatever age, 21 years old from Murdoch's been involved in this altercation en route to Fremantle hospital. <laughs> That's how my mum finds out about it. So you can imagine how shitty herself she was. But I was in high spirits. One of my best pickup lines to date. You know, getting stitched up in the hospital, drunk as fuck. Turned at the nurse. I was like, "So you come here often?" <laughs> <laughs> She's like, "I work here." And then turned around <laughs> and walked off. Did you get a victims of crime payout? I that? did actually. Yeah. Fuck. I haven't thought about this in a while actually. But yeah, I did. You fill in a victims of crime compo statement, tell them what happened and. I haven't got like 14 grand paid when, off my uni. <laughs> when for Roms to come through, she got fucking run over just after COVID. Shit. Really? Yeah, she was just waiting in a, like, waiting across the road in Richmond, just in a car bay, but there's like no crosswalk or whatever, just waiting. And a taxi thought they were trying to hail a taxi, just swung in, fucking parked on her foot, and it just <laughs> fucking drove off and crushed like all the bones and foot, and she was a moon boot for ages, and there's no security cameras around there, but we feel in victims of crime. I'll take fucking 10 grand for her yeah, pain. Yeah, for real. I'll take half. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm legally entitled to it. That's how marriage works. Yeah, it, it, it is. She gets half and nothing because I'm fucking, I'm not very successful. So <laughs> sucked into her. Unless you get injured on the job. Yeah, true. It was you that pushed her in front of that car, wasn't it? It, it was. It was me driving. <laughs> I'm a secret taxi driver. Um, my mum's probably finding a lot on this podcast <laughs> out now, speaking of mum's finding out stuff. So God bless. She thinks I'm a saint. Where did your interest in motorbikes come from? Has that always been like since a child or is that a new, yeah, a new thing? I guess so. Um, I was always into them. Um, my granddad used to ride them. Like he had, I think it was the first 1200 like Kawasaki in the UK and he used to ride them in India when he was in like his special boat service, I think, like the British SAS. And then they converted their um, like tank shift to foot shift, like with like fucking railroad pegs. And like, so he used to ride motorbikes. Dad rode them in when he lived in South Africa. Um, they've lived all around the place. And then I never really had them as a kid. We had like a couple little dirt bikes, like a little uh, Z50 Honda that would fucking ride into fences. And I used to go out and do some dirt bike shit with um, like my brother and stuff like that, but not heaps. Like I used to like bikes and then I, I think <clears throat> dad gave them up because I, I don't really know if it's the story, but I think. I, th- I think he had an accident or something like that. I could be wrong. Um, he'll correct me. 
fucking he'll message me straight away and be like, that was the wrong story. <laughs> um, and then I turned 18 and went and got my license straight away. Um, went and got a little 250 Ninja and flogged the fucking ass out of it. I feel so sorry for the guy that I sold it to. I'm, whatever your name is, I'm sorry. That bike was not what I told you it was. <laughs> though. It was fucking post-track day, sold it, and fucking did that. And then bought a couple of other little bikes uh, and then moved to Melbourne and missed riding bikes. So I went to India. Uh, with Himalayan heroes so we rode motorbikes through the Himalayas for like fucking 12 days but if you get to do that trip um, do it it's a once in a lifetime so we rode like Kadungla Chaglangla like the three highest motorable passes in the world so there's higher mountains but these are the legally accessible non-military ones so we rode through the snow dirt I did a little section for Channel 10 with Kate Peck who she's a fucking bad bad woman sick rider the whole trip was amazing scared the living crap out of me most of the time and then Moved back to Melbourne or moved to Melbourne and Ron bought me a Harley for my 30th, which is shout outs to Ronald. Um, bought me a fucking Harley, always wanted one. Little 1200 Sporty. I got ripped off. Uh, it's, I bought a fucking lemon. No, I mean, uh, I've spent so much money on that thing. Um, it's, is it running now? No, it's not. Um, I need to do a bunch of stuff to it. And then I want a motorbike during COVID, eh? Um, a guy Chris was raffling one off I bought a $40 ticket or whatever it was and I've got a like 48 panhead frame and an 88 Evo like I'm building a chopper um, and then we bought a bike for Rom and another mini bike so I have four motorbikes in an apartment none of them run um, <laughs> but I love it like I love motorbikes it's one of the I, I tend to do this thing and I think I'm much like Scott every time an opportunity presents it in my life that I like a hobby I somehow monetize it like I photography, filmmaking, fucking I DJ'd for a bit. I did some design. Like I just have this thing of this, this ADHD hyperfixation thing. But motorbikes are the one thing that I'll never do it with. And I really feel good. And it helped me out a bit of a COVID slump, just working on my bike downstairs, like a communal garage. I'm the fucking, I'm the bane of the existence in our apartment block. Just the fucking Harley parts everywhere. Take the boy um, out of Rocco. That's it. <laughs> it's true. But I love it. I love motorbikes. There's something, there's something fucking really cool about it. Like, oh, cool. It makes me sound like a dick. Oh God, I keep sounding like a, more but there's you don't need to worry about how you sound it's how i look um <laughs> <laughs> no you just is like this shit is it, it, it lets people know who you dude, are dude i've been so self-conscious this whole time i'm like is this really? interesting will people listen to it like i've just got this self which we'll go back on to but like motorbike i just like i just like and i found a really cool community over there of chopper dudes and they're the loveliest human beings ever like they look like a bunch of misfits and but they're just the nicest community of people and I just love riding bikes. I love riding motorbikes. It's just something that I've done, you know, on and off a little bit as a kid. But as I've got older, I've really found that's like not my calling, but it's just something I can do and enjoy. And nothing's better than jumping on a bike and just going for a ride. If you're in a bad mood and, and it's much like anything like sport, any kind of sport or interest, you either get it or you don't. And if you don't get it, I don't think you ever will. Um, but jumping on a bike and going for a ride is so good and sharing with Rom jump, jumping on the back we'll go out for a ride for the day go somewhere just do it and do silly shit obviously um, a few sketchy things here and there but it's just fun and I know it's dangerous it's fucking dangerous but so is drinking and so is fucking you know across driving from, a car or yeah, crossing the road yeah I mean motorbikes definitely are more dangerous they're fucking the death trap they're two wheel you know they're two wheel coffins but I love I, I love it That's so I started a little bit as a kid and my brother was a mechanic big rev head used to go down the drags in Quinana and help him tow cars. And so I grew up as like a huge rev head and a huge bogan doing all that shit. So I, I lived for it then and now I've really found it. And in Melbourne is such a motorbike friendly city, dude. Like you don't legally, well, you can legally park pretty much anywhere as long as it's out the way, as long as it's not in, you can just park anywhere. Traffic sucks in uh, Melbourne. So you can just fucking ride. You can do whatever you like and I just really enjoy it and I want to do more motorbike trips I want to do Mongolia's on the list Thailand's on the list wouldn't mind riding Russia um, and I'm not a good motorbike rider I'm not skillful I'm fucking terrible at it um, I'm not particularly uh, yeah I'm not gifted I'm not athletically gifted or motorsport gifted in any way whatsoever but I really enjoy it and I found a good community of dudes doing it it's a good escape so mm. um, shout out to motorbike people I wouldn't mind doing some more motorbike work actually you know I wouldn't mind doing some <laughs> here we go monetizing my passions mm. but like i feel really connected to it and there's there's just something that you understand with it that's really cool um and yeah ride bikes people do it <laughs> buy motorbikes buy more of them buy more two-wheel death traps that's the way it should go i want to i like i, I want to ride some scary bikes now i've got a fucking thirst for it it's really like world changing a eh? it changes how like you define fast from that point on 
when I had the 600, it was, it was so fast, especially when I first got it. I was just like, wow, this thing is a fucking bullet. And then I got onto a thousand in the fire blade and it was like, I still remember to this day, it was like what you'd imagine being on the Starship Enterprise would be when they go into hyperdrive, like everything just goes, it's like my body melted <laughs> on the back of this bike. It's just so fast. Dude, the first time I rode an R1, I thought I was going to die. Honestly, like you just open that throttle and it's just like you, you said, Starship Enterprise, your body's thrown back into exam. And you're, you're just holding on for dear fucking life and nothing else. You're just gripping those handlebars and you're just going, please don't die. And that's how I feel. I know some people have confidence in their motorcycles, but I do not at all, <laughs> nor do I have much confidence in my ability. And I ride a death trap anyway. So, um, but you're right. There's something undes- indescribable about the, a big bike. Heart. Oh yeah, I've been really self-conscious this whole time. That's what I was talking about before. <laughs> it's fucking weird. I'm like, I want it to be interesting. I want people to want to listen to it. But I feel like I've got nothing to say. If that makes sense. Yeah, not a, pity, no one not thinks, a pity party, but... No, no, no one thinks that they have anything to say. Like, the only reason that we do this podcast is because the conversation is interesting. You know, like, everyone... You speak to people all the time and you think that... Like... It's, say you meet someone and you're like, we, we've had people on like um, a guy that wrote a book that lived in Medi- Medellin and his experiences living in Medellin and that are just kind of like the icebreaker to the conversation. You know, like everyone has, everyone has interesting stories. Everyone has something interesting to say and people will, people take positives and negatives from everything. Podcasts are cool because you can, like, I like podcasts, even random ones that I get put onto and I find, like, I like listening to people talk, but I'm, I guess I'm very self-conscious and I'm like, I feel like, and it sounds, again, I don't want to be, it's like, I'm not like a pity party or anything like that. I'm like, do I have anything interesting to say? Like, and I know I do, like, I, I know I do have some stories interesting to say, but do I have anything that's worth people taking 20, 30, 40, an hour, two hours out of their time to listen to? Is this a conversation that people want to hear? Um, for it so I guess I'm very self-conscious of that and I can fucking talk dude like you you know I can talk I people tell me to shut up all the time like I can fucking talk my ear off but the older I get the more I try to I'm doing it now think about what I'm saying yeah and like am I saying something that's worthwhile saying or am I just talking for the sake of talking because when I get nervous I talk because it's you this, feel the space I feel I feel the space because maybe it's a coping mechanism or something like that, but I feel like it's easier to be the loudest voice in the room and be heard and have the attention drawn to you because then no one can, whether it's interject or say shit about you, like when there's silence, you, people can always turn the conversation on you. But if you fucking take charge and lead to the conversation, it's very easy to turn it around or either about you in a positive way or turn it about someone else in a negative way. And that's a flaw of my character. So I'm very conscious of conversations like this because there's space in between and that space scares the absolute living shit out of me because I'm always worried about what people are thinking about me and um, whether what I'm saying is true or right or just or whether what I'm saying is any fucking good. So my coping mechanism now, and I found out through therapy, if you don't do therapy, don't talk to someone, you're a fucking coward. Um, It's so important because I've learned that that is my coping mechanism. It's a way of averting any kind of trauma against me from you know being growing up being bullied or whatever whatever it stems from i can control the narrative so if i'm always talking and i'm always leading the conversation i'm controlling the narrative and i don't have to fear anymore and that's something i've learned about myself um which has been quite powerful and i still do it all the time i catch myself slipping Um, but you recognize it now but i recognize it now and i know that's one of my faults is leading the narrative um because i'm scared of where it could go if i don't take charge of and don't take control of the room and I'm a control freak in that way because the moment I let go of, you know, the steering wheel in the car, you let go, it can, you know, my wheels aren't aligned so it can fucking quickly end up in the, <laughs> end up in the bush on the side of the road. So if you take charge and you demand the attention and control the room, then you are incomplete and out of control of your life, which you is not feel, true. It's a fallacy. Do you feel that's in social situations or do you feel that in a work environment? Mostly in social, yep. definitely in a work environment. I'm a control freak. 
um, I'll do stuff and just do it because I'm scared of letting it go. But you're managing shit at the time, like you're in control. So it's like, it, it, it calls for that, you know? Yeah, it works a bit different. Um, I just don't like control stuff because I'm a control freak and I'm worried about it going wrong. Um, you know, I like taking creative control and doing stuff, but working in a team, working with Adam, working with Mo, shout out Mo, fucking the saint of a human being. She's the best producer ever. Um, I've learned to relinquish that control, but in social settings, I do it. It's a nervous habit. You know, I'll talk over people. Um, I'll make the story about me. Someone tells a story, and that's typical ADD or non-neurotypical symptoms. Um, and I'm aware of that now. But I, I wasn't growing up, you know, not until I was like 20s that I realized that that was a thing, and that was something that was, I guess, out of my control. I don't like saying out of my control because nothing's out it's of your control. It's just a learned pattern of behavior. It's like a coping mechanism. That, right? that, and that's what it is. It's a coping mechanism. So conversations like this scare the absolute shit out of me, shit out of me because I know it's not in the current tense and no one's recording it, it doesn't fucking matter because people forget about it or they, you know, they can talk behind me about my back and that's something I can't, you know, that's something I can't control. Oh, but in the moment I can it. control the fucking shit out. I can command, you've seen me, like I can, yeah. I can command a room. I can be the fucking spotlight on me superstar. Um, maybe I was, that's something that I learned growing up and, you know, doing, you know, performing arts and stuff like that. Or, you know, like I said, maybe it's just a way to cope with my insecurities is like I'm an extrovert but I'm also fucking anxious as fuck all the time. All the time. Like, I'll leave now. I'll get in the car and be like, what are they saying to me in their group chat? Being like, that guy fucking sucked. We're not going to put that out or whatever. Like, it's a constant fear that I have. And I, that feeds my creativity. But it also feel, feeds my, uh, I joked about it before, feeds my urge to take a toaster in a bath. <laughs> That's, there's that saying that um, you have nothing to fear than fear itself. Like, your expectation of what people are going to say about you or how they feel about you is completely out of your control and it's never as bad as you think it's going to be um the the times that i've found in my life where people have had a negative view of me it's so off it, it's so off the mark that it doesn't even bother me i don't know whether that's like a um an, an arrogance or something like that but i definitely sympathize with the idea like as you grow up you start to realize what your character flaws are and especially when you're put in situations where you aren't comfortable like i'm in that situation at the moment where i'm single for the first time in such a fucking long time and i'm very single like i'm like not i, d I don't have any i don't have any true connection to anything you're like you know? porn hub single <laughs> that's it's one way to put it it's one of those interesting things though where i realize that like i put my when you have someone and you have someone to bounce off or you have like a romantic relationship with someone, you get, it's kind of a feedback loop. You know, you need like a little bit of, you actually inadvertently use it as attention. Um, it, 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 cross, it ticks that box of attention. It's like, oh, I'm getting feedback from someone. It's like, hey, I miss you or they, you know, like, Vice, all those sort of things pop on validation yeah and i'm realizing that i need to learn to live without that validation dude i'd be fucked if it wasn't for rom i'd be mm. fucking i'd be a no one like she is my feedback loop she brings me in check she'll be like cunt you're talking too much can you shut the fuck up and i get pissed off at the time but i need it like i need to be checked and i'm constantly worrying about that it's like i'm getting real real now um yeah, I, I'm so scared of what people will say about me behind my back or like I'll have a conversation, you know, we'll go to the pub, I'll say something, you'll be like, and I'll say something, won't think about it, then I'll be like having a shower that night and I'll have the conversation in my head and I'll be like, what the, f why, th why did those words leave your fucking lips? Like, can you learn to shut up, man? Um, it's the, and the, I, it's I, I'm, in and your I'm learning. Head, though. I know, it's in my head and I'm learning, I'm learning to deal with it, but it's... And it's a two it's a two part thing for me. It's learning how to deal with it in the situation and not say those things because I say some dumb shit. But then also to be like, who fucking cares? So I'm I'm learning. I'm like, and I found it hard at getting diagnosed with a you know neuro non neurotypical or neurodivergent uh, disorder. I don't like labeling it, but whatever. But when I was an adult, you know, I was fucking twenty eight. Mm. That's a big I was reality. Thirty nine. Yeah, like, and I knew I knew my whole life I was different. Like I was always brought up being like you're special you're a special little fucking butterfly you're different you're creative you're just a special you're so smart you're so intelligent i was like now can i had something fucking wrong with me eh like and it's fine and I'm, I'm okay with that now i wasn't 
when I didn't know that I wasn't diet, like when I didn't know that there was things that were outside of my control. And now part of my learning journey as an adult, you know, in the midst of, I don't know how long I'm going to live. I could be halfway through my life, but I'm learning to accept, you know, the things that I cannot change and mm. learn to change the light. I don't know what they're saying. And is, that's but, the, but that's all you can do because the reality is that you have like, you're just dealt cards in life like your dealt cards in life and you adapt and you find your path through there by utilizing those or working around those like i don't think that there's i don't think there's anyone that's normal and i do think that normal if there is it would be quite boring it doesn't normal doesn't exist everyone's everyone's a freak everyone's a fucking freak in their own way and i'm like i've struggled with it for so long in COVID, i was in a fucking real dark place like i was suicidal i mean i've been suicidal several times in my life i've fucking i've self-harmed before um, and I've learned to get through that. And now my struggle is, yeah, learning space and learning to control my inner dialogue and be, I'm, I'm never present. I'm never, ever present. I'm always on that fucking phone or I'm always doing something. But the reason I'm doing something is because I'm scared to not be doing something. If that makes sense. Like yeah, I'm it's always, the busy trap. I, it's the busy, I've always, I'm like, I'm fiddling, I'm biting my nails. I'm fucking playing a game. I'm reading a book. I'm playing on my phone. I'm watching TV. I always have to be busy. Even when I'm lying on the couch in the depths of depression, I'm always doing something because I'm scared to be alone. Because when I'm alone, those, that fucking, that addiction demon or that like self doubt starts knocking on my door. But the last few years, I think I've really changed as a person. Now I'm learning to deal with those things. And then, you know, like I said, learning to run, I'm dealing with some, fu I have some fucking real people in my life. Like when I'm being a dickhead, I got mates, it'll be like, you're being a fucking idiot. Like not even nice. <laughs> Like just brutal shit. But you've built those in. You've built those things in as a way of, as a way of pushing through. And like that self awareness is important. I find the same thing. I just, I um, I've spoke about it before, but I drove down south a while ago and just, just by myself and went on a camping trip by myself to just try and get that space and try and get that non distraction. And as I was driving down there, the first thing I do is just go to put a podcast on. And I was like, no. That's not what this is about. So I sat in silence and drove from Perth to Augusta and was just like, let's see what happens here. And it's incredibly confronting. I had it on a train once when I was younger. I, fl I, I caught a train from Berlin to the south of France and my battery died on my laptop and I had no cell service. So I was just sitting there and you're forced. There's things that pop into your head during that period which have been sitting underneath that you don't realize and they're the things you're scared of they're the things that you know you're watching a youtube video while playing a game on your phone and checking social media and doing all this stuff because you're trying to keep that shit at bay but it's never as fucking bad as you think it is it just lives there as a fear it's like oh when i've got nothing to do who am i if i'm not working what's my identity if i'm not doing this and the reality is like I mean, Delby puts it quite eloquently. He's like, you're not shit. No one cares about you. People don't think about you at all. I, I've started to learn that. Yeah. I definitely I think have. that that's like a, it's an aggressive way of looking at it. The way that I like to subscribe is that your thoughts and your fears and all those things are, no, I don't think anyone's ever had, I don't think anyone's ever lived their greatest fear but they live under the um, they live under the the fear the, of that fear. The fear of that happening. Yeah, like I, the best way to describe how I feel is bees in my fucking head. Like it, it sounds really silly, but my life is bees in my head constantly. It's just like a fucking hive in there of just my mind is chaos, dude. Like like my brain is a fucking Jackson Pollock painting for fuck's mm. sake. Like it's it's insane and I'm, I'm as i get older i've slowly started to deal with not necessarily even deal with it i've slowly started to deal with the fact that that's what my head is and now i need to at this age now i'm working out how to uh put those bees into a hive or turn that you know pollock painting into a fucking mona lisa or some shit like that well like, you've harvested that you've made that shit work for you to this point and there is points but where... It has, but it hasn't always worked. Like, mm. I have this the perception from the outside, and everyone does. Like, this fucking glamour life. Like, I was on tour doing all this stuff. Like, 
traveling around the world, doing all this stuff, but it's not fucking glamour. Like it's- Oh, it's not for you, right? It's no. for everyone else. It's like, leave me alone, I'm doing fine. It's glamour for everyone else. And I've just clung to these clicks and these trends and these addictions and these leading the conversation just because I'm fucking, I'm scared all the time. Like I, it's, I just live in abject fear of myself. <laughs> um, but I, I like to think in the last, especially, you know, COVID and pre-COVID that I've, I've changed. Um, and I'm hoping that I continue to change so I can leave, leave a mark. Like, I don't want to leave a mark on the world as like a fucking, you know, I, I don't want to people necessarily remember me in a hundred years, but I want people to, when they meet me or friends, you know, you stuff like that, sit down and you know how sometimes I just think about my mates, you know, I'm just like, he's a mad cunt. He's cool. He's a fucking idiot. Like he's a loser. I want people to think about me and be like, Sean's all right. Yeah. Like he's cool. Like well, I, we I invited in you on here for that reason. Like you're an interesting fucking guy. You know what I mean? Like you're an interesting guy to fucking talk to. And you always have been. I think that living in fear, like I do the same thing. And like, I think if you've got enough space and you have enough of an imagination, you can imagine all the negative things that are going on, but it's part and parcel. I've watched some brilliant television series while I've been trying to distract myself from my deepest, darkest fears. And I watched one that was, um, you ever seen Fleabag? No, I haven't. I get so told to watch it all the time. I think I watched, start, watched the first 15 minutes, but I was stoned and I was like, this phone sucks. It is it brilliant. Watch but Vikings she says shit. that there's this monologue in, it in the second series where she's in confession and she says, she's like, I'm scared all the time. Like She's like, I want someone to tell me what to wear, what to like, who to love, like all these things. And I'd seen it before and I watched it recently with a friend and I was watching it and I just fucking started crying when I was watching it because it was just like this, it was similar to what you were just saying in the sense of like, I think at our base level, when we take away like the things that you have to do in the day or whatever your daily list is, when, when it's just you and you have nothing else and it doesn't matter if you're married or you're single or you're doing well in life or you're doing poorly in life, there is that moment of no one knows what the fuck is going on. None of us have a fucking clue. We can subscribe to a path and we can apply ourselves to that, but no one's 100% sure that that's the right way. No I one knows. We don't know if there's a God or if there's a, a rhyme or a reason there as to no why God. we're just, here or what's going just, on. There's no God. It doesn't matter. Like It's like we are all just trying our best. We kind of subscribe to an idea of, who we are like what sort of a friend we are what sort of a boyfriend we are what sort of a person we are as far as society goes but none of us are completely convinced that it's the right it's not at all like again everyone says it but i've really started to feel it more that like no one knows what the fuck they're doing parents know what they're doing i always thought my parents had their fucking shit together um they do i mean they they do by all means but really in the scheme of things no one knows what they're fucking doing because statistically the chance of us existing is fucking zero and the fact that we are sentient beings that are able to speak is just fucking crazy and that's what scares me as well like i'm full of that fear hopefully one day i can make peace with that fear and i'm getting there but i think it's a lifetime you i don't think anyone's really ever at peace when you see a buddhist monk floating in the air doing whatever they're doing 12 you know hours of meditation not speaking their whole life i'm like i don't even think that comes at peace eh? there's a self-awareness that comes with growing up and i found this when i started going into my 30s probably more in like my mid 30s there's a self-awareness which i romanticize about the time when i didn't have it because how good was it? It was just nicer just being like, oh, this is what I do and this is who I am. But as you start to hit those little benchmarks and one of them is realizing that your parents just did their fucking best. I found this when I started doing therapy and they were like criticizing my parents quite a lot. Like in the, because that's what therapists tend to do. Like it's not your fault. You know what I mean? Which you is- start to realize- that I don't necessarily describe to. I hate that's not your fault. It's fucking your fault, and you need to take some. Well, you need to take responsibility for your actions. Like you said, everyone fucking sucks. No one knows what the fuck they're doing. You take some responsibility, but also there's, there's a lot of trauma passed down through. But parents. at the same time, dude, like at the, I think people do bad things or treat people badly because they're they're living from their perspective and they have fears and they have fucking traumas and they have all that sort of stuff shitty people still exist but there's a reason that they exist and i hope that these days if someone does something shitty to me or someone is negative towards me i really think about them as what it is that they're dealing with and it's a lot easier because it stops you being reactive 
So if someone sucks or someone does something shit, you're probably dealing with your own shit. This isn't about me. And you can kind of keep it moving. Everyone needs to be less reactive. I'm yeah. the most reactive guy in the world. I'm the biggest knee jerk. I mean, you've shared an office with me for five years. I'm the biggest fucking knee jerk kind in the world. Like you'll say something to me. I'm like, fuck you, Scott. It's fucking your fault. Dude, I do it. I'm responsible. I'm, I'm like that as all the time. I mean, we were talking, we were talking about the other day and you were like, you gave me shit for something in a group chat. And I was just like, <laughs> like I just say, and immediately bit back. And I'm like, why did I do that? I do that all the time. I'll write something and be like, fuck, I, I, like I, I took the bait, hook, line, and fucking sinker. But you know what? Like, it's not that fucking serious. Like all of this stuff, it's, if, you, if, if you focus on it so much and that, that like kind of self-improvement and introspection, it feels so intense and you're like, oh, who am I? What am I doing? But the reality is tomorrow is going to happen. You need to get up and you're going to do your other shit. You're just tweaking things and your mind starts to recognize things that it didn't recognize before. And that's what self-awareness sure. is. And you try and take it on board and you just try and do better. I think when people hit that level of depression where they go towards suicide and stuff like that, it becomes an overwhelming amount of stress and pressure on how am I going to fix myself? What am I going to do? And you get burnt out. And then you're like, I, there's, there's no way out of this. Dude, it's crazy you talk about that. Like when I was fucking wanting to die and it's happened three significant times in my life, I've really wanted to fucking end it. Like seriously thought about it. Like thought about the least painful way or the easiest way or even the fucking messiest way is a fuck you. Like I, like I can't believe my life got to that point to mm. do it and nothing anyone can say would ever fix that like if you're gonna i truly believe if someone's gonna do it they're gonna do it and you can't stop them or you would never fucking know but i i don't know why i was doing it like i was miserable and there's all sorts of triggers and i won't go into it but i don't know why i was fucking thinking about it i don't know why like i don't know whether it was because i wanted to die i'm terrified of death. i i have one fear and it's dying and i don't know why I think it's because I don't believe there's anything after there. And the, mm. the thought of nothingness is terrifying. The, the thought of just blackness and not being awake, like, do you remember sleeping? No, I don't remember being asleep. That's terrifying. So that's why I'm scared of death. So I don't know why I was thinking about killing myself. And I still don't to this day. Was it a cry for help? I don't know. Was it, I didn't want to be here? Did I not want to be a burden? I don't know. And I still, I'm going to spend the rest of my life wondering why I wanted to die. Well, the mind's a powerful thing your mind has that in it i think we may be the only species that has suicide as an option right dolphins don't go i mean whales do beach whales <laughs> no, beach have themselves. You, was it this is it the sea there's a video of seals like jumping off cliffs and shit because it's like the cliffs are too over or is that them just trying to escape there's a fucking david Attenborough one of cliffs uh, seals just literally like silly salmoning off the cliffs it's fucking crazy yeah i don't think that's to die though i know what you're talking about it's obviously to like I think it's to, to get somewhere that is don't realize that by doing it. Oh, so they're just fucking idiots. Yeah, but the so. thing is, if you laid out, if you laid out as a human being, what your options are, suicide is one of them. Suicide solves a lot of problems, but it causes a fucking lot more. I've, we've, we've all had friends, you know, kill ourselves. We've had close people, um, even people in passing, you know, there's several, you know, music figures in the last years that have killed themselves. I've had people, you know, know people that have done it. It causes more pain for everyone around you. And that's what I think would probably stop me from doing it. Mm. But if I did it, I still don't know why I would have done it, which is crazy to think. Like, yeah, I think, but it's, just I mean, the, I think it's just the depression, the overarching depths of despair yeah, taking no, control of your body. The way that I see it, I can say clearly I've never been at that point. I've been at the point where I'm scared that I would drop down a level into that being something. Because I, the way that I see it is that because I know people that have done it, I'm scared of the fact that I, know that I knew them as people and that they reached a point in their mind that I have not gone to. And I know that that exists. You can't just ignore it. But the way that I, real, the way that I have come to understand it is staying alive is the price that you pay for the people who love you. Shit is really fucking hard sometimes and it can compound and you can go down a path that's really negative. But at the end of the day, by, a byproduct of you existing is that there are people that love you and you would create a huge rift and a huge amount of pain in their life by leaving. Think about the, the people that you've hurt in your life or people that have loved you that you've walked away from and things like that. Like that is a tangible thing. It's a tangible thing that sits with you and it's a tangible thing that never really leaves you. And there's like a guilt and a pain that you carry that's attached to that. And I think I don't know what happens after we die, but I think that that energy 
doesn't disappear. And I think that there is a responsibility that you have as an active person in people's lives to weather the storm. I think the leaving behind is what's terrifying. And, but I don't, I will never get mad at someone for doing it. I hate when people like say, you are so self, you know, that person's so selfish for killing themselves. Mm. They're not. People do it for other people because they think they're a fucking burden. And there's no other way. There's no other option to get better. And I will never glorify suicide. I joked before about saying it solves a lot of problems, but it will, it, I will never glorify it. But I'll also never hold a grudge against someone that did it because they did it and that was their choice. And that was the best option for them at the time. It wasn't the best option, but it was the best option for them at the time. And that's why I don't subscribe to a lot of religions and stuff like that. Cause they're like, you'll never get to heaven. You kill yourself. And like, who are you to fucking judge that? Like, it's mm. not your place to do it. Um, but I'm just glad that I didn't. I'm glad that I'm here. I'm glad that I got fucking mates that I can call. People are starting to talk about this stuff, man. And like, I think the reality is like you said before, is like, everyone's fucking scared and no one really knows what the fuck's going on and everyone's trying to just fucking do their best the fact that you can talk about that stuff and the fact that we talk about that stuff like it's fucking important because it, i think it just makes people feel less alone like if if there's any message that i could give of, of shit that i've learned through just my life which has been you know relatively easy i'm sure for the most part is your ego doesn't allow especially growing up your ego doesn't really allow you to say that you're struggling with shit and saying that you're struggling with shit isn't an excuse it's not like i'm just struggling with stuff at the moment the reality is if you just fucking talk about what you're going through talk about how you're feeling about stuff the amount of room that is there to get what's in your head out into the world allows you to organize it it's i've said this before it's like having an incredibly fucking messy like my apartment right now is just full of boxes and shit right because i've just moved house and it's uncomfortable and it's just a fucking shit show but when i take the time to actually fucking organize everything and put it where it's meant to go everything feels like it has some order again and that anxiety lives that's what it feels like inside my head sometimes it's like there is just a bunch of shit on top of a bunch of other shit it all has a place it all has somewhere where it needs to go but sometimes you need to remove yourself from the distractions of all the things that we spoke about before and addiction and substances and stuff play into that because they push you further down into that. And you just need to take the time to actually fucking organize the thoughts that are in your head. And the best way to do that is to actually speak it out of your mind. Just let, let it come out of your fucking mouth. Yeah. And I think it's also being okay with having a messy room, mm. um, you know, being okay with having the messy room and knowing that you can sort it and it is you know one step at a time you know how do you start a, you know running a marathon you you know it's not putting your shoes on it's not doing anything it's taking a single step like it sounds really silly and like it's like an overdone trope but it's fucking it's really fucking true dude well like, think about like you said before you know like you talk about that stuff like you you just voice that you've been suicidal at different parts of your life what's your biggest fear in saying that you think that we're gonna fucking laugh at you? No, I don't have a fear yeah. in saying it. No, no, that's I don't. I don't have a fear in saying it now. I'm, I'm real, and I think, um, like you said, it's like I've now realized no one knows what the fuck they're doing. Nobody knows what the fuck they're doing. You and you have to fucking show up, and you have to be present, and you have to be accountable for your actions. And I'm accountable for what I've done in my life, and I will very openly talk about those times in my life because I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed. I'm ashamed of other stuff. I'm ashamed of the things I talk and saying, you know, I'm ashamed of all sorts of other stuff. That's part of my life. I'm not ashamed for because I wouldn't be who I am today without that happening. Mm. Um, and but you wouldn't be who you are today without any of it happening. So I'm not, I'm not ashamed. That's one thing I'm not scared of talking about is that. And, um, you know, people be like, Oh, it's a, it's a fucking lame. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's fucking, you know, d doing that stuff is fucking lame. I was lame for doing it, but I'm not, that's one thing I'm not afraid to talk about mm. is mental health and, feeling shit and doing that and whatever your way of coping is it mine's making jokes about doing it um making fun of myself for doing it but that, that's one thing i'm in my life i'm not ashamed of is talking about doing that and talking about the dark places i've been the dark places i will go um it helps me be who i am it also helps me create i like telling that's why i'm so ingrained in narrative work like i want to do more narrative documentary work and um because i want to tell stories and i think stories are important and these are stories you know the story of me doing that the story you know you talk openly about your dad you talk about you know japan and you know all that kind of shit like i think sharing those stories is so important because it helps other people but it also helps you mm. 
And I think there's ego in that. I think the fact that it helps other people allows you to fucking speak that into space. Like, I don't think it's completely selfless discussing this stuff. It fully helps me. Like, it fully helps me to fucking be open and vulnerable or whatever. Like, it's like all of those things. Knowing, like, I bumped into a guy last night the first time ever. What was the guy's name that, um, I don't know if you remember this. The guy that was sent in the question last week. You remember we sp- spoke about, he was like, oh, I'm a university. Elijah. Elijah. I fucking went into a bar. It was a friend's birthday last night. It was like a surprise party. And I was standing at the bar. And for the first time ever, because this has happened to mm. you a few times, this guy comes up to me and he goes, hey, man, this is going to sound really weird because I know so much about you and you don't know me at all. <laughs> and he was like, my name's Elijah and I love the podcast. And I'd just been editing the last podcast. And I was like, you sent in a question and we fucking spoke about it for like an hour. <laughs> And he was like, what the fuck? And I was like, man, this is crazy because I don't, like, I'm not out as socially, I think, as you are. So I have never had someone come up and say, like, I've never had someone that I've never met before come up and say, hey, man, like, I fucking love the podcast. And I was like, this is fucking great. Like, this is a moment. And he goes, I just got a job. Nah. And I was like, fuck, man, congratulations. Like, it was sick. So shout outs to Elijah. Because yeah, that was- Shout like, Elijah. That was fire. But yeah, man, like, this stuff- we, we speak about this all the time but doing this is a fucking doing this gives me as much as it gives anyone that fucking listens to it and we get people fucking hitting us up you have people that you know and people that look up to you like the same way that you looked, looked up to, to Liam Underwood and stuff and be like I, I guarantee if people are struggling if, if people are like in that industry and are struggling with just their own fucking path and all of that hearing that it's not hearing that you don't have your fucking shit together to that to that level is probably a fucking benefit dude i don't have my shit together yeah. but yeah here i fucking am i'm just i'm literally fucking winging it i'm throwing as much shit as the wall i can and some of it's fucking sticking a lot sticking lately which is pretty cool dude that's what yeah. i'm at i was sitting there last night and i was thinking about the fact that you know i'm going to fucking london and it's becoming pretty real now because i moved i moved out of my rental i'm back into the airbnb of horrors and um <laughs> I the dildo bag. Yeah, the the Airbnb of dildo trauma, and I was sitting there. I was like, oh, I, I really need to do this now. You know, like I really need to do it, and it's a fucking confronting thing. And I'm like, I am trying to create fucking shockwaves in my life to to give myself a fucking to give myself some sort of an, a more interesting story or something that I'm happening with, that I'm happy with. But there is, and I'd never really considered this before, there is this fucking idea of just it failing completely and my best years being behind me. And that's a fucking fear. But then you sit there, this really helps if you smoke weed, because you sit there and you really think about that stuff. And then you're like, it doesn't really matter. Who Again, fucking I'm cares just, you're thinking about the worst you. case, you're thinking about the worst case scenario. Who fucking cares? Just fucking show up and do it just fucking just grip it and rip it brother that's where i'm at now i'm just fucking grip i talk about all this sad shit as well but it's also just fucking grip it and rip it and just fucking work and work on yourself and work on your friends and work on your business work on your side hustle and unless your side hustle and be stupid and have fucking good times and just like dude i'm the biggest fuckwit ever i'm just an idiot all the time and i'm learning to love it and appreciate it while working through a bunch of stuff and i won't let it change me fundamentally but i'm hoping to get better as a human but yeah like you said you just gotta fucking who cares if your best years are behind you who cares if fucking everything comes crashing and burning because the world's fucking gonna end one day mm. just fucking go out in a blaze of glory go down swinging brother we were all um i think yeah we're all just dealing with the self-awareness just fucking hits you like a have you ever thought about hands? Like the self-awareness is weird. Like we're sentient beings. Like look at your hands and they just do their own thing all the time. I think about that <laughs> shit. I think about that stuff for heaps when I'm not even stoned. Like do you ever look at like that whole self-awareness thing? Like have you ever felt the fact that you've got fucking ears? Like, <laughs> <laughs> fucking crazy. Like that was just a real side thing. I was just looking at my hands then and I was like, dude, I gotta have hands. I'm not even fucking high. It's a fucking weird I've thing been to doing think about. Okay. So there's something there with, with, um, with us filming this now and we've had technical difficulties. So the there's, only, there's only a on, camera on you. just my double chin yeah, yeah. and my fucking ugly mouth. Dude, like seeing the way that my mouth moves while I talk, I see other people and it feels like their jaw moves downwards when they talk and it feels like my upper face comes down to me. And I'm so fucking like, 
my biggest fear was being on camera because I hate being photographed. You've just pointed out I can't stop looking at you. Oh, you know, I know, dude. Like, I look at myself and I'm like, how does anyone... When I... Like, I think there's, there's, there's value in my comments in when I'm speaking to someone. But I'm like, how do people look at me when I talk? Because there's a fucking... But the reality is that people... Everyone that's ever accepted me in life that is friends with me or I've had any form of relationship with has been totally fine and more aware of who I am, how I look, what I do than I am. But being on camera all the time now, I'm like... I'm dreading watching this, bro. Like, I've got this fucking... You see my fucking blinky eye thing all the time. I'm going to see and be like... And then I'm now I've said it, I'll be like... You don't stim anywhere near as much as you did when I when I was in an office with you. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's an ADD thing or... A mild, I've also been told it could be mild Tourette's, but I... I stim when I'm aware of stimming. So someone brings it to my attention, like, bro, are you all right? Like, you're blinking heaps. Like, you fucking, you tweaking cunt. And then my body's like, you have eyelids. <laughs> <laughs> you must close them yeah. and open them heaps. So I used to stim heaps. I'm, I'm better. I'm not sure if it's meds or just being a fucking mad cunt. And dealing with, <laughs> just working through some shit, dealing with it. But I become hyper aware of it now. I become hyper aware and I roll my eyes and do this weird thing. But it's just like, yeah, it's like this. I become hyper aware of my whole body sometimes. Like when I'm running, I'll be like, I have feet. Feet are fucking weird. They're doing their own thing. and I'm trying to control them, but I'm not really controlling them. Um, that's a metaphor for life, bro. <laughs> it's just fucking just on a ball hurtling through the earth and we have no control over what we do. Exactly. And the, but that's it, man. I think that there is, you can go, I went in my, in my sort of early thirties, I went through this hyper focused thing on like trying to figure out like why I'm here, like that, that, that existential thing. And I thought I was just a fucking genius for like going down that hole. But the reality is that I think that you hit a point where you just accept that there is a certain ignorance in being alive and joining the herd and that's, that's fine. fine and, and it's great. great. You know what I mean? Like, because I think biologically, we're only here, like, if you were to look at it purely on a biological level, you're here to procreate and continue the species. But the fact that I'm 40 years old and I haven't spawned kids means that I'm a total waste of space on Earth. You don't look a day over 39, bro. (laughs) Thank you, bro. (laughs) But the reality is that you can keep hurtling down that fucking thing to self-destruction and be really fucking overwhelmed by those questions. Or you can be like, oh, yeah... I still have friends. I still have like a purpose. There is a certain amount of things like me being a graphic designer or a musician or me being a a partner or a son or any of these sorts of things. They all, regardless of what I'm thinking about, regardless of what I'm pondering, they, they still exist and I still need to service those things. And that's what life is. It's like, this is the circumstances that I'm in. These are the things that I can change, but don't take yourself too fucking seriously because at the end of the day, you're still just another lemming doing your fucking thing. <laughs> just try and be a, the best version of that that you can and be in service to the people that fucking care about you. Lemmings is a good, really, a really good analogy for like good game, but good analogy. It's definitely it's like, like a, 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 an age appropriate reference. Yeah. It's <laughs> so like if this fucking 20 year olds listening to this and being like, Lemmings, what? I play Minecraft. I don't Get know. I've never shit. played Minecraft, but I figured like, play Lemmings. Lemmings is fucking sick. How it's good was culture, it? It's culture for fuck's sake. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a whole thing. Play it's Prince a- of Persia while you're there. Fucking A. I haven't played Prince of Persia, should I? Bro, Prince of Persia. If they bring out Prince Quest. of Persia now. Police Quest, oh, yeah. Police Quest. Pirates. What's that pirate one? Yeah, I remember the Pirates one. Oh, uh, that was Monkey Island. Monkey, Monkey Island, Island yes. bro. You know, I still do <laughs> Man, that, that plays in my head more than I care. All of those old like games are really, really All the old Sierra dope. games? Yeah, hard. God. Space Quest? Then Leisure went, Suit Larry went into oh, Leisure games. Suit Larry. Fuck that game is problematic as all fuck. Yeah. It <laughs> definitely oh. led me down. It it definitely educated me when I was younger. I that found out what chicks was like the most important thing. <laughs> I found out what prostitutes were through Leisure Suit Larry. I reckon <laughs> like that game was fucking wild, dude. I played Duke Nukem for the first time in a long time again. Equally problematic. There's game. strippers in that game, dude. It's fucking <laughs> shaky, <crazy>. baby. <laughs> I just Duke fucking Nukem. I might play it again. Get a Switch. Play Duke and Nukem. Do it. It's a great Dude. game. I think if you looked at anything from that period with the, like through the lens of 2022, not even through the social lens of 22, 2022, but just as you as a being human a being, you'd be human. like, oh shit. Yeah, I've done, I've watched just a bunch of movies from that period. Like not even like 
with a woke hat on just watching it I'm, it, I'm like dude dude I've spoke about it before dude. but I'll just do it for this the point of this conversation watch um, Woodstock 99 the documentary that came out no, it, it is astonishing I was watching it going I thought this was all so cool and I was just watching it going oh my god like we didn't the stand fires, a chance fires people dying and shit dude like, MTV just being like yeah chicks get you t-. like it was literally like society at the time was just a Limp Bizkit song how good a limp it? Live, laugh, limp biscuit. That is the motto <laughs> of my fucking life. Live, laugh, limp biscuit. God bless Fred Durst. Oh my God. So good. Greatest band. One of the greatest bands ever. Great cover art on that fucking uh, album as well. What was with it? The um, break dancer with the the, yeah, uh, cartoon drawing. What, what's the album called? Um, Significant, fucking, other. Significant, yeah. Significant Other with like he's holding it like this with a hat mm-hmm. and like the right. Oh, so oh, man, spectacular. I watched them play metro city would have been like oh 2010 2011 halloween they came dressed out as guns and roses it was fucking superb <laughs> so so good we'll never forget it you know saren is um saren's done he's, he's obviously met like probably the most famous entertainers of our generation easily working with them and stuff and the one thing that i'd spoke to him about that he was the most excited about was that after Soundwave one year he got a call from Fred Durst management and they were like, I think he was, he agreed he was going to do an after party or something. And they were like, Oh, Mr. Durst wants to come. And they gave him like an area and he was like, anything like, <laughs> <laughs> because you can meet, like you can meet. Fucking, he can have the club dude. Just to sit there with Fred Durst. Like, even though I think he's probably a piece of shit, just like white trash, dude. Don't tarnish it's my It's definitely idol, worth. Brother. It's definitely worth having a conversation with that dude. I would like. He. I do not. Do not meet your idols. You know what? That's one takeaway from working in the music industry. Do not meet your fucking idols because they all suck. I have fucking horror stories. Ta- come on, let's and go. They all suck. But no, I'm not gonna throw no, let's anyone. Go, I'm bro. not gonna. You th- can't. You know what's what? the point? Drake is one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life. First of all, shout out Aubrey. Audrey, Aubrey, Aubrey, Aubrey. Oh, Aubrey. First name basis. Introduced himself as Aubrey, shook my hand, had a conversation. Someone went up to talk to him and he was like, can't you see him having a chat? And then he fucked off. It was really cool. Nice guy. Um, I got a photo with, that was when I had a beard. Uh, what's, who was the cunt's name that used to tour with him? Big beard, backwards hat, did that. Um, sort of looked like you. Yeah, two on song. <laughs> what was, what was his name? I can't name? remember. It was like the dude that was in the, started from the bottom video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he came up for me, asked me for a photo because we looked alike and put it on his Snapchat. <laughs> God bless who I work with um, Madden Brothers. Fucking sucked. They were just oh, really we rude. Them, we met one of them. It was real nice. No, they were really rude that day. Like, and they wouldn't talk to me in a room. I was in a room of like four people and they talked to their manager to talk to me. And I was like, dude, are you fucking kidding me? Go fuck yourself. They might've just been having a bad day. That's the thing though, is you, you can't put it down to like, um, you can't put it down to them as people. They're just fucking touring all the time and having bad days. But we like, had one that was, um, it got cut off. We actually spoke about this on a podcast, but the fucking, remember the audio got cut off about the ASAP Rocky? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, so we went to, um, I, th- I think you were probably there. You were there? Did you come on stage with us? No, but I was So, there. yeah, we went to um, Origin one year and we got a call saying, well, Josh, you got a call, didn't you? Saying, can you get to the stage? We were like on our way to the festival. And um, yeah, we'd all done a bunch of molly and stuff. And we ended up at fucking um, getting side of stage. Security would just really not on their game that day because they were just accepting that we were meant to be there. We didn't have the passes or anything. And we ended up side of stage and they gave us all hoodies. It was like me, Josh, Brett, Daniel Bradshaw. That other camera will probably work now. Hold on, I just need a message from She's like, when are you fucking finishing? It's quarter past uh, We'll do like 15 no, minutes. Right. Um, Yeah, so it was like, it was like me, Josh, Bradshaw from Street X, uh, Delby, your business partner, um, Shock One was there. I can't remember who else. There was a whole fucking bunch of us. Um, and basically, they just gave us hoodies and said, okay, we need you to go on stage with ASAP Rocky. And we're all fucking hammered. So we're like, yeah, okay. So we're just sort of standing around backstage and it lasted like way longer than it fucking should have. Hold on. Fuck, this is just killing me. Right. It's just the world telling us not to tell this ASAP Rocky story. No, I know, right? No, we got nothing on anything. 
Oh, uh, yep. <laughs> it's going to look so weird. Yeah, you just change Chop the changes. Chop changes, yeah. It's just the worst run production of all time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so it was me, me, Josh, um, Shock One was there, fucking Gucci smoothie, <laughs> like a whole fucking bunch of us. And yeah, we end up side of stage and they just gave us hoodies and we're like, you're going to go on stage with ASAP Rocky. And we're like, high as shit. We're just like, okay. It was New Year's Eve. And then um, the fucking van rocks up backstage and ASAP Rocky gets out and he gets all of us. We're like in a huddle, like as if you're just about to go and play a fucking game of gridiron or some shit. And he goes, I just want you all to be in this moment with me and he's just like looking you dead in the eye and he was just the most commanding i swear to god like i've met like a bunch of famous people he was the most commanding person i've ever met and he was just like it just felt like he was just speaking to you directly and he was like don't worry about your phone don't worry about your fucking dramas in life don't worry about anything he goes we just we're going to go on stage and we're just here and it's just us and it's this moment and we were like okay <laughs> Who's this and cunt, then, Coach Carter? Dude, it was fucking crazy. Like, that dude could be president. Like, it was crazy how, like, he could speak directly to you. And then we get on stage and we were all fucking... The, the, the song starts, it's the first song. And we just come out all in hoods and just kick the shit out of each other for, like, the first 16 of whatever it is. And then he just, like, did he rise out of the... He rises out of the stage in the same hood and then just pulls his hood off and starts rapping. So it's just like this misdirection thing. And then we just walk off stage and we're like, did that even happen? Did that just happen? There's a lot of surreality. Is surreality a word? There's a lot of surreal moments with that music stuff. Like there's times I've caught myself on stage and I'm like, dude. This well, is you need to think about it. It's the moment. Like, like what we see it from a different perspective because we've been involved in various different forms of it. But yeah, there's 20,000 really. 20, people in the crowd, right? It's 20,000 people that are watching ASAP Rocky for the foot. And, and that's a memory that they're going to take with them for life. So all that they see is what is presented to them. And he is creating a moment in history for them, which, which makes up part of their identity. And he says, he was aware of that. So he was like, this is what's happening. And this is what our role is in that. And yeah. that's fucking powerful. I loved, I like, I liked catching myself in those moments when I was filming on stage, you know, I'd be on stage behind, the fucking who's who of rappers and DJs and stuff like that in front of 30,000 people holding a camera. Um, I mean, wearing stage blacks on who I, who I was and I became quite complacent with it. It was just fucking second nature. People come back, like, how cool is your job? I was like, dude, my job fucking sucks half the time, eh? It's fucking shit house. Or, or I'd be like, oh yeah, it's all right, bro. And like play it down. I think trying to maybe be cool. But I, again, it just became your, your normal is what you know. And like your normal is your normal and your normal is not someone else's normal. So my normal was being on stage at festivals with 30,000 people touring and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, but then occasionally I'd catch myself on a moment on stage. I remember when I wrote you when Storms in there, there's fucking flames going off and he's like, I want you to follow me and be behind me the whole time because I want this footage. And I would just remember catching myself and being like, this is actually surreal. There's 30,000 people that paid $300 a fucking ticket to be here. I'm getting paid to be on stage with rappers i have a hate relationship love hate but lots of you know bit of taste in my mouth we talked about earlier in the podcast about music but those moments will live with me forever they're moments that i'll tell my kids like i've still got my tour passes and stuff like that like it's fu it was fucking cool and i still love it and if i get the chance to do it i will do it again given the right circumstances but catching in those in the, those moments is fucking sick and i'm so grateful i got to live that life because it's something i always dreamed of like from when i was 15 shooting shows and doing that kind of stuff it's those cool moments the complacency sucks in like any industry though you become jaded and you don't appreciate for what it is but those few times i caught myself like looking on a wireless monitor a cable cam zooming over fucking twenty thousand people with asap rocky and fucking pyro going off and confetti and shit like that and then watching a movie go live and it gets shared a million times or whatever you're like yeah, it's cool. That's yeah, what makes it you're worth. a part of that. That's what makes it worthwhile. And that's the lasting impression that I want to leave on people as people watch something and go, I felt like I was fucking there. That was sick. That's sick. I'm, we, we will pretty much end it there, but I just wanted you to tell me who was the fucking, who was the idols you don't want to meet and what happened. All of them. Like, there's not one particular story. I think Drake is probably the best artist I've met. Who uh, was it? Was there anyone where you were like, this, I, I am so excited to meet this person and then they just completely killed the, killed the whole vibe? Oh, oh, 
you're putting me under the spotlight now. I've met who was my you know what I think I'm like you my memory recall on command is fucking terrible <laughs> if I have to think of a story I have to tell it then and there I think that's why I butt in all the time um, Madden Brothers were fucking awful did not like working them with whatsoever um, who else has been really shitty uh, they're, they're, look they're, honestly there's not one in particular I think what stands out for me is there's no memorable artist that I've met aside from maybe Drake and some Australian people that have been like you know, ASAP Ferg, absolute legend, lovely human being, always remember him, always tell people good mm -hmm. stories about him. Goldlink, absolute legend, loved working with him. But there's, it's more the case of less particular horror stories. If I sat here long enough, I could fucking list them off, but it's more so the fact that more artists let me down. Just being fucking lame or just being, you know, white M&Ms only on their rider or like just weird shit and shit that makes my life difficult shooting and like, well, you can't, you can't shoot from the pit. Like, it's like, dude, I'm, you're paying me to make you content. You're making me shoot at the back of a fucking venue that has no riser and I don't have the right equipment for it because I wasn't briefed on this. So it's, it's less the case of specific horror stories, which everyone loves to hear. And I, I don't love throwing people under the bus. It's more the case of, I was let down by artists or not impressed by artists more often than I was impressed by them. And I know everyone has their bad days, but also their job is to entertain. It's like going to get a fucking beer at a bar or, a, you know, coffee at a cafe and the person serving you is just an outright fucking asshole. It's like your job paid to smile with, as an artist, you know, do that. You have bad days and I understand that. But a lot of the time I think what it was for me and they're just humans and I forgot that. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. I forget that they're just humans. They're humans that have bad days or they're humans that are really good artists, but maybe not a personable person. A lot of artists are actually introverts. They're terrible at, you know, social situations. So it's less so the fact that, you know, there was horror stories, but I just think I was let down and not necessarily by who they are as a person. Now, now I'm, you know, articulating the words, it's less so about who they are as a person. It's more so the fact that I just put them on a fucking pedestal. You know, I put ASAP Rocky on a pedestal. I put you know x artist on a pedestal i put this artist on a pedestal and they're just not they're just people and everyone has a good day everyone has a bad day and i'm just you know i like them as an artist i idolize their music i love everything they do as a producer but as a person it's probably someone i'll never hang out with and i think that's what i projected onto them i was like i want them to be scott or i want them to be josh and sit down and fucking you know smoke a cone with them or have a drink or just have a conversation and then be like oh what's your number i'll text you it's like they don't give a fuck about me bro mm. no one gives a fuck and you just need to get over that and appreciate them for what they are at the time and the art that they make. Um, you just can't put them onto that huge pedestal. I mean, I do have, you know, horror, and you know what it is? The smaller the artist, the more of a fuck with they are. <laughs> <laughs> it's that like little chihuahua syndrome. like, <laughs> And then the big ones are just like, leave, leave, leave me alone, bro. I got a fucking head cold or I've just been on a flight for 36 hours. I don't want to shake your hand. And I learned to accept that. Oh, that's fucking awesome. I don't know, this is a great chat, dude. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to my nonsensical, uh, contradictive statements. It's more sensical than you can imagine. I'll let you, uh, I just, I'm dreaming of you just listening back to this or not you, not you listening back to it, the period before it comes out and you just completely abject fear. <laughs> and then it will come out and you'll be like, that was great. Yeah. Hey, future Sean, you did all right, bro. <laughs> you did all right. But if you said something, you will think about it in the shower and it will live with you for the rest of your life. And that's okay. That's okay, man. We're all you got to wait till we put it out so we can always chop it out, mate. <laughs> no, fucking, fucking throw me under the bus. Um, yeah. Good night and God bless. Thanks Likewise, so much. Man. Peace. Peace. Let's say all of our fucking technical issues. That was wonderful. Man, that was a new standard.